Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the International Congress, the Book of Political Science, Structure, Hierarchy, and Recipient from Antiquity to the Middle Age. I'm honored to welcome the speakers of the Congress. Many of them are members of the Collegium Politicum and or members of the Seneca Institute for Classical Studies of the Carlos III University. The title of this Congress practically coincides with the title of a single project of the Spanish National Plan of Investigations, the Book of Political Science during Medieval Spain from Aristotle to the Foundation of the Modern Ages, a project financed by the Ministerio de Ciencia e Innovación. The goal of this conference is double. From one hand, as a presentation of specific papers on topics that unite the members of the Collegium Politicum and the members of the Seneca Institute. From the other hand, it is an opportunity of scientific exchange between the investigators, professors, and students of the Carlos III University, in particular of the Faculty of Humanities, Communication, and Documentation. The history of the cooperation between the Collegium Politicum and the Carlos III University is long and prestigious, since uh, two international congresses were celebrated in the Getafe campus in the years uh, 28 and 2012. The Carlos III University, through a peculiar investigation program, always supported many activities related to the previous mentioned national project, as were the seminars Politique Episteme in December 2019, and the official presentation of the current project, uh, Lissipol, El Libro de Ciencia Política en la España Medieval, in, um, in November uh, 2021, allowing this peculiar program of the Carlos III, allowing a fruitful exchange between the members of our institutions uh, and other investigators. The opportunity to combine uh, topics uh, such as structure, hierarchy, and material supports of the Book of Political Science is the demonstration of a concrete interest by the academic institutions and groups of investigators who answered the call for paper launched in November 2022. Eventually, the program of the conference, which is going to start, registers, registers the participation of investigators from eight European and non-European countries, with representations of Germany, Spain, UK, Japan, Italy, Portugal, Czech Republic, and Turkey. During recent years, members of the Seneca Institute, teaching at the Department of Humanities, History, Geography, and Art of the Carlos III University, are enjoying the opportunity to collaborate with the new degree course in uh, history and politics, coordinated by social sciences faculty and the humanities faculty. Of course, in the profile of this uh, bachelor, ancient and medieval political thought play an important role. They have to play an important role, uh, I, I underline, regarding the construction of modern and contemporary world. For this reason, the Congress enjoys the patronage of numerous academic institutions, including the bachelor's degree in history and politics, uh, uh, whose uh, collaboration is always uh, fruitful and uh, uh, offers uh, many benefits to our investigation. With great pleasure, I give the floor to Professor Francisco Lisi, founder of the Seneca Institute and co-founder of the Collegium Politicum. Thank you so much for staying here with uh, us, uh, Professor Lisi. Good, thank you very much. Uh, good, a so, few, few words for giving you welcome to our Congress. I hope we have a fruitful 
in, uh, interchange of uh, opinion and knowledge about the uh, uh, about ancient political philosophy in its reception in the mid Middle Age. I think the very important uh, foundations of also modern political thought and political theory. What I have no many things to say, but I hope uh, again that our discussion will be a kind of a return to the Collegium Politicum, old, uh, old uh, politics, as well. that is um, the use of different languages so far as possible. And uh, that's, um, you know, and good fi finally, I want to express my interest that the collaboration of the different institutions is not limited to this Collegium Politicum, already 22 years old. Yes. We have always uh, wanted to present an European project, etc., but never had we the ability or the <laughs> capability to doing so, I hope Not this yet. within the future. Not yet. Not well, yet. I hope we have we have to discuss that then after in the assembly. Yes. But this would be very important for our studies to have a, a European projection, and also an uh, enlargement of the Collegium Politicum at, as such. For instance, rec uh, recovering people from France, from England, etc., as the former. Times. Good. Thank you very much, and I give my the word to Professor Jes Jesus Bermejo, the, the director of the of the department. <laughs> so, thank you so much, Professor Lisi. Thank you so much, Professor Miguel Kurnis. It's it's a, a, I'm, I'm so glad. It's a it's a truly honor to be here just to offer you a, a warm welcome to this university and especially to my department of humanities, history, geography of arts, uh, especially to the international audience, the international speakers that are composing this truly very interesting activity, you know. I think uh, in the, this activity, this international conference, is, uh, is honoring the, 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 the long tradition, the long background the, uh, in relationship to the research on the, the, the impact of classical sources, the classical culture in the, in, in the history of the Western thought that started yeah. mainly Professor, uh, uh, professor Lee in this university and, and is also continuing Professor Michele Kournis with this brightness and, 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 and this capacity to, to design and develop this kind of uh, very interesting uh, uh, conferences. This, uh, the, the topic of this of this conference is, is especially uh, interesting for for us in the department because we we are finishing the the, the, the first generation on the degree of uh, uh, of the of, of the grade of history and politics, which is a is a, is a very good representation on on this truly interdisciplinary efforts that we are making. Even uh, uh, even in the in the design of our undergraduate courses, so it's it's a it's a degree it's a, a, a very 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 important for our uh, department, and I think this international conference, the fourth that are investing professors like uh, Michele Kurnis in the in the development of this interdisciplinary discussion between class, especially in the classical world specialist in the medieval history, especially in the history of the philosophy. I think it's a, it's a, bright, it's a great idea, and I'm very, very thanked and very honored act as, the, uh, as, the, as the host in the department of, of, of this international conference. So I'm, I'm very thanked to all the organizers, to Professor Lisi, to Professor Michele Kurnis, to all institutions involved, the Seneca were very kind and, and, and careful uh, uh, Seneca Institute, the, the, the Collegium Politicum, and, and nothing, nothing, nothing more. I, I wish you a, a fruitful discussion and a, a, a very nice conference. Thanks so much.
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, dear Professor Lisi. Thank you so much, uh, dear uh, Director, Professor Bermejo Tirado. Um, I have to say that uh, the director of our department uh, always supports and promotes the activities of the Seneca Institute and uh, of the area of medieval history. I would like also to thank all those who have cooperated in the organization of the Congress, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of uh, Humanities, uh, Professor Maria Victoria Lucero Pavon, the Director of the Seneca Institute, Professor Consuelo Carrasco Garcia, the Dean of the Bachelor in History and Politics, Professor Andrew Richards, uh, and then uh, the Infrastructure Service of the University, which assists us uh, technically in the retransmission uh, um, of the uh, of all the sessions uh, of the conference uh, in the YouTube uh, channel of uh, Carlos III University. And uh, uh, finally, a uh, special thanks uh, to Mr. Juan Manuel uh, Tabillo for the logistical aspects uh, and this role of uh, guide of the speakers uh, in different uh, Getafe locations. So uh, now it's, uh, it's going to start the first session of uh, the conference. Best wishes to everybody for a good work and enjoy the single sessions of all the Congress. Thank you so much for staying here. Sorry, while the session is uh, beginning, um, I repeat that uh, in the program you have got the reference to the conference web page because uh, in, uh, in a single page of this platform are available all the documents of the conference. Uh, I think that the reference is uh, um, activity files uh, or something similar and there are all the handouts, uh, documents, and presentations uh, you uh, sent me in the previous day. So you can download the free all this material if you have a connection. <laughs> 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 We're still hoping. Ah. <laughs> Good. OK. I am very pleased to um, make the presentation of Professor Jakob Inek of the Theological Faculty of the Charles University in Prague, Catholic Theology. Um, Professor Zinek, could I was or have, have the, the honor to be the one of the directors of his dissertation. He has worked very uh, intensively in classical political theory, especially Plato, his dissertation on the Republic of Plato uh, internationally uh, uh, evaluated very, a very good uh, um, dissertation, and also his habilitation yes, in Aristotelian political theory. He was also had published several contributions to the uh, in political theory. Um, and uh, he is now in Prague as professor, but he was before professor at the University of Pardubice and is <coughs> member of the <coughs> Collegium Politicum since uh, so at least 12 years. I don't, uh, don't remember, but a lot of time here. <laughs> Good. He will speak about uh, 
political form versus political substance, some remarks on the worth of political science. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for this kind of, uh, this kind of words. I, I think I, I can speak for all of us to express our gratitude to all orga organizers of this wonderful evening, to Michele Kunis, of course, Francisco Lisi, and Juan, Juan Manuel Tabio. So thank you very much. It's, uh, it's g a great honor for me to start this, uh, this, uh, this, this event. Uh, my time slot has been enlarged. Uh, so I think I'm able, I will be able to read uh, the whole text. Uh, I also prepared the handout, which is on the right side of the screen, whereas the text itself is on the left side of the screen. I hope it's not uh, too much confuse confusing for you. In case it is, I can s simply limit myself to, to, uh, to the text itself. The first thi thing, uh, can you read the, the text? Is it visible for all of you? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So to introduction, Aristotle is generally regarded as the founder of political science. This is a fact accepted not only by historians of philosophy, but also by contemporary political scientists who acknowledge Aristotle as their predecessor. Authors like Maurice de Vege or Giovanni Sartori. However, both reasons given by political scientists for this are mistaken. Aristotle is neither, neither a value neutral researcher in political sphere, nor is he the first to use the method of examining politics on the basis of its social presuppositions. Plato is more likely to be that. If then we speak of Aristotle's politics as the first book of political science in our tradition, we must look for other reasons. We may anticipate that these reasons will not lie solely in the realm of methodology, as for the political scientists. For classical scholarship and the history of political thought, this question also implies that earlier works in the field of political thought, especially those of Plato, cannot be counted among the books of political science. What then is, the, is new and constitutive in Aristotle compared to Plato for the emergence of this new genre? It is not so much the degree of specialization in the political domain. Plato's laws, which in accordance with the older interpretative tradition we claim to be Plato's major political work, laws are also strongly specialized in the distinctively political problems of constitutions, constitution and law. And yet they must be considered not a work of political <coughs> science. A change in content is essential to the emer emergence of the specific domain, that is, the clarification of, of what is the proper object of political inquiry. This is the polis, the city, as the locus and the basis of political life. In the following text, <coughs> I want to briefly discuss some passages <coughs> that testify to this transformation, this emergence of the new field. <coughs> I must begin, however, with formal issues, because these are the first to be announced when studying political, uh, Aristotle politics. <coughs> the polis and the tradition of politeia. To conceive of the city as a starting point for political thought is much less obvious in Aristotle time than it might seem uh, from our today's perspective. For the modern reader, accustomed to the fact that the subject of political philosophy is quite naturally the state, for him may be difficult to grasp <coughs> that the question what is a city is firstly explicitly raised only by Aristotle. The reach and significance of this novelty must be seen against the backdrop of the fact that by the time of Aristotle's writing, there was already a more than a century, century old and at the time widely dif differentiated tradition of political thought, whose origin lie with Herodotus, that examined political phenomena from the angle of the constitution, and which is sometimes called the tradition of politeia. <coughs> and we, we have some, <coughs> some bibliographical indications of the authors. By precisely focusing on the theme of the city as such, Aristotle certainly does not reject this tradition. On the contrary, he usually con consciously inserts himself into, into it by his own reflections. He is, however, determined to reciprocate it in a radically critical spirit, which ultimately leads to a fundamentally different orientation of his own political thought. The main motive for, for this new orientation is the rejection of a conception that completes that tradition by reducing all the complexity and di diversity of political life to the notion of the constitution as order. 
We are obviously talking about Plato, who translates the problem of the polis into the question of the internal structure of its parts, which constitutes the formal or eidetic moment of politics. The reason for this approach lies in Plato's conception of political philosophy as a science of the soul and its care, epimeliates psyches. Since the soul is a whole composed of parts, and since the care of the soul is a way of ordering those parts, politics is such an ordering. The most natural path for political philosophy to take, and its ultimate goal, is therefore the paralyzation of both soul and, the poli and politics. As is evident, such a view misses the signific significance of the question after what is actually ordered. More precisely, this question is superfluous in Plato's conception, since what is ordered, that is the city, but equally the soul or the cosmos, what is ordered is actually just its ordering or constitution. In Aristotle too, the, the connection between city and constitution remains undoubtedly still valid. On the other hand, it must be said that it is Aristotle who is aware of the possibility of examining the city as such, and the directly without a mediating question of constitution. This is extremely significant for the subsequent historical development and justifies us in considering Aristotle's investigation of the city as a decisive contribution to the emergence of political science. The discovery of the city as a distinct and irreducible phenomenon, the grasp of which requires the elaboration of a specific method and the emergence of a separate scientific discipline, is the occasion for discovery of the political, the fundamental existential aspect of all life. Political pragmatia. Formally, Aristotle's specific conception of knowledge, characterized by a tendency to separate different subdisciplines and pragmatia, is crucial for the development of the first book of political science. Aristotle uses the term pragmatia to refer to treatment, treatments of different subject areas, Greek pragmata, usually in the sense of separate disciplines. More, more rarely, it has the significance of the, of the actual object of the investigation in question. The separation of a pragmatia, of, uh, of, of, of a pragmatia is guided by an entirely different logic than modern scientific specialization. The emphasis here is not on method, but on epistemic motivation, intention, or purpose, which typically lies in the domain of either theory or practice, knowledge or action. A related <coughs> point is that the meaning of pragmatia is probably coextensive with esoterico logoi. In the esoteric dimension of a school, there is, a, of course, a wider scope for the author's and intentions and motivations, especially for the direction of his works to a particular audience. Further, if the pragmatia originates in the dimension of inter-school deb debate, it can be expected, A, to be strongly polemical, and B, not to depict the whole subject, but to omit certain parts that are sufficiently known and which are non-controversial within the school. Instead, explicit efforts will be made to address thesis that contradict, contradict the views of other members of the school. This corresponds precisely to the situation of the relationship between two key concepts of political theory, polis and politeia. While on the, on the question of constitution, Aristotle simply takes much from Plato. See, for example, his six-fold classification, which is considered as Aristotelian, but we all know that uh, it's taken from the dialogue statesman. So it's one, on one hand. On the other hand, he emphasizes the notion of the city in a very distinctive and even challenging way. Of course, these general findings alone do not answer the question why such a pragmatia is established in the field of politics. But two things are, tenta are tentatively clear, clear. First, if the constitution of new pragmatia is less about specialization and method and more about motivation and intention, and it is understandable why the political pragmatia attains this separate status preferentially, insofar as political issues are among the most motivating, or if you want to use the currently fashionable term, the most controversial. This is a difference from, for example, the economic sphere. See, we have the pseudo Aristotelian economic, uh, economic sphere for the separate investigation of which there are also perquisites in the existing tradition, for example, Hesiod, of course. Nevertheless, in Aristotle, it remains only part 
of the political treaties. Secondly, this higher motivation of political inquiry also seems to be related to the specific dignity of the pro uh, proper objects, the thing itself, pragma, or we can see, we, we can also encounter to oikeon in respect to this object. And this oikeon, this, this pragma is the polis, of course. In purely linguistic terms, the subject of the new science consists in ta politica, things that belong to the city. And precisely this is also the traditional name of Aristotle's treatises, treatise. The earliest evidence is probably Alexander's commentary on the metaphysics. This title, ta politica, probably uh, illustrates the idea of the independence of the field based on the importance of the main subject, which is the polis. The dignity of the term political is also <coughs> indirectly confirmed by the fact that for the political sphere, and it's a very interesting fact, modern languages have retained the original Greek terminology. In this, both the ambiguous reception of these terms by Latin authors and the high medieval translations of Aristotle politics play a key role. Cicero may serve as a model, model case of the former, who, although in his main political work explicitly following Plato's Politeia, replaces its central concept with Latin res publica. At the same time, quotes Plato's work itself under the title politia. The term politia was then used in a general sense as the equivalent of res publica and appears in a number of other Latin authors such as uh, Tertullian, Ambrose of Malon, and John of Salisbury. If then passes, it then passes into vernacular languages to denote a government or regime for example, fr uh, French poli politi, uh, for good order or administration. From there we then derive a French phrase for corpus politicum, corps de police, policy, or corps de police. And similarly in English we find police in the sense of government. The adjective politicus itself only definitively became part of the European political vocabulary under the influence of the translations of Aristotle's politics and ethics in the High Middle Ages. The significance of Merbeke's translation of the politics into Latin in terms of the formation of later political terminology lies in the key decision not to translate certain uh, central terms and instead to merely transliterate them. In doing so, the translator emphasizes both their Greek origin and their specific character. These decisions of William Merbeke were apparently taken up by Nicolas Doresme in his translation of the politics into French, when he chose politique for Williams politicus, formed after the Greek politicus, of course, in identical places, passages. It is from politique, seen as a term denoting a sphere of activity, that the German politique is then also shown to have originated. In parallel, politique appears in 15th century English as an adjective denoting government, politic rule, to good politic, both in official documents of the kingdom. In view of this apparently normative terminology, it is remarkable that we do not find any writing of writings of ta politica in the list of Aristotle's works preserved by Diogenes of Laertius. <coughs> in uh, general, however, we can trust in the reliability of the list in the sense that the politics can be found under a different title in Diogenes. The most promising items in terms of the hypothesis uh, seem to be, uh, this hypothesis seem to be those listed under numbers uh, 74, 75. Politica, beta, politices, acroaseos, os etheophras to alpha, beta, etc. Uh, beta in the, in the number for, uh, 70, uh, 40, uh, 74 probably indicates the number of books and it could therefore be book 7 or book 8 if, if, or of our politics which differ significantly in content and form from the rest of the books. And at the same time form a meaningful whole. Two interpretations are then possible for entry number 75. Either Diogenes entry hides the rest of the politics or covers the rest of the politics, so books uh, one to six, uh, written however not according to number of books but of scrolls, uh, six books but eight scrolls. Or the second option, the entry represents the whole politics, of course. In either case, the Diogenes list contains all that survives and thus no part of the politics has been lost. A more serious problem for the existence of the separate political pragmatia is 
a somewhat heterogeneous form of the body of writings known to us as the politics. We cannot, of course, open here the complex question of the internal coherence of the work and comment on the debate between the Unitarian and the developmentalist interpretations. In very rough terms, however, we can say twofold. First, to understand the conditions of the emergence of the political pragmatia, it is not necessary to overemphasize the doctrinal unity of the parts of the convolute. And certainly, it's not necessary to assist it by shifting its parts, as pre jigerian philology did. Since knowledge of the given context of the writing provides sufficient room for explaining the heterogeneity without having to state an internal inconsistency. And second, that, het that heterogeneity can and does have a different reason than the development of the author's thought. If we take into account the historical content of writing in the fourth century BCE, and in particular the notion of motivated pragmatia, then an alternate interpretation is offered, one that assumes a deliberate targeting of different parts to different audiences. Here I have a part, uh, short part on this, maybe uh, I hope I have time to read it. A book of political science in the context of contemporary writing. In considering Aristotle motives as a writer, one cannot rely on modern ideas, ideas about literary and editorial practice. It is only in Aristotle time that the written tradition gradually gains the upper hand over the oral tradition which, however, continues to play an indefinitely more important role compared to today. Aristotle's philosophy is therefore also largely affected by the tension between the written and the oral. The Platonic preference for, the oral, uh, for oral, oral communication over written fixation is reflected in Aristotle's clear preference for dialogical form of philosophy, which is manifested in his typical writing practices, internal dialogue, deliberate aporias, Echoes of contemporary debates. That's all we know from uh, that, that. All we know from from his writings. Overall, the style of Aristotle's thought, including his political thought, can be characterized as strongly dialectical. The relation to the oral tradition is also evident in the assumption of the possibility of constant refinement, of the involvement of additional interpretation. This, in Platonic terms, the help of the inscriber, of the, the help to the text. Here probably lies the origin of the impression of repetitiveness and sometimes, on the contrary, of incompleteness of the text, by which many of its parts affect, affect later interpreters. Instead of incompleteness, however, it is more fruitful to speak of openness towards the oral dimension. All of these practices are obviously crucial in the author's eyes to legitimize the result achieves, achieved. The differentiation between the written and the oral is also reflected in the graduation of writings in terms of their focus on a particular audience. Also Plato's injunction not to communicate the essentials in writing no, no longer binds his disciplines, as Aristotle. Aristotle agrees with his belief, if Plato's belief, in the qualitative difference of the audience, and thus the principle that different people are to be addressed differently remains in force. But whereas Plato uses a single logos to meet this requirement, which by means of various allusions that only some people understand, is ultimately able to make the necessary distinctions between people and its, uh, on its own, Aristotle is forced to use a plurality of logoi for the same purpose. According to this viewpoint, different addressees can be distinguished, and thus different forms of relationship between the author and his audience. The most difficult texts are addressed to the immediate <coughs> pupils, and this difficulty then decreases according to the distance from the author and the expected breadth of the audience, or wide for the audience. In other words, in order to draw out the differences between the different parts of Aristotle's work, and therefore between the different books of the politics, the distinction between exoteric and esoteric expression is most appropriate. However, this distinction is understood differently from Plato. For Aristotle, it is rather a scale on which esoteric and exoteric expressions play the role of extreme possibilities, between which a number of intermediate and mixed forms develop. At the level of political thought, this is the reason for the existence of different writings on the same thematic range of uh, thematic topic of police. Different parts of Aristotle politics therefore assume different audiences. My suggestion, the continuous treatise, or the 
it's, it's a treatise as a whole, Politics 4 to 6, is intended for the internal circle of direct discipline, d disciples. Politics 1 to 3, on the other hand, to a wider circle of educated people. And it is ev evident that Aristotle makes a further distinction here. Some addressees show a stronger interest and at the same time a certain philosophical awareness. For them, the separate treatise Politics 3 is addressed. For others, the philosophical interest is rather more general, but they belong nevertheless to the educated, well-educated citizens. For them, political one is designed. Political two stands even further away in this degree of accessibility. In this, it approaches the nature of the set of books seven uh, to eight, wh uh, which are closely related in content to the, uh, co to the uh, law codex of Plato's nomoi, Plato's laws, and thus already stand on the borderline between esoteric and ex uh, esoteric and exoteric lectures. <coughs> okay, I skip to the next uh, to the to the next passage which already deals with uh, the text, and here uh, the handout is pertinent. I st start with the first book, of course. Having clarified these former issues, I would now like to look at the opening passages of all the treatises that make up the whole of today's politics. These are, in fact, a kind of mini pragmatei, apparently originally written as a separate treatises. Book one, two, and three, and then uh, uh, books four to six and seven and eight. I'm concerned with their beginnings because in them one can trace, as in a kind of proemium, what matters most to the author in terms of his motivation. And each time we encounter a similar picture. The conscious, though rarely explicit, distinction and simultaneous in inclusion of the substantive and formal aspects of politics, polis and politeia. The first book of Aristotle politics begins with the following very known, well, well, well known words. We observe that every state is a certain sort of association and that every association is formed for some good purpose. For in all their actions, all men aim at what they think good. Clearly then, while all associations aim at some good, the association which is the most certain of all and embraces all the others aims highest, that is, at the most sovereign of all goods. This is the association called a city, the association which takes the form of a city, koinonia politike. In the case of book one of, pol of, polit of the politics, we begin with an exception. This book is the only one in the entire set of eight books that makes the city as such the object of its investigation. In contrast, all the remaining books of the politics announce an examination of the constitution in their introductory, introductory sections. In fact, the first book breaks out of the existing tradition of the politeia, tradition of politeia, as discussed above, and is undoubtedly programmatic in its uniqueness. uniqueness. This is not to say that Aristotle does not build on the previous tradition at all. On the contrary, his words about the city are a fairly <coughs> accurate paraphrase of Plato's words. But it is one of the characteristics of the Aristotelian reception of Plato that the Platonic words are used with a quite different, even opposite intention. It is a repetition of Plato's words from the Timaeus about the cosmos as a perfect and self-sufficient animal, including other living beings. Since Aristotle in Politics 1.1 identifies the city as including the community of others, as, uh, the other communities, and in the following chapter, he will characterize the city as a perfect and self-sufficient community, and al also as a whole, including humans and other communities as parts. The city in his conception seems to include all the elements that characterize the Platonic cosmos. The Platonic cosmos is, of course, a god, worthy of imitation. And it is likely that this is also true of the city in Aristotle's eyes. What is missing from our passage in the politics, however, is a reference to life. The community is not said to be alive here, or the city is not alive explicitly, unlike the Platonic cosmos. But it is surely not against the sense of the present sentence, uh, our passage, to add this aspect, aspect of life, which is recognized in another part of the work, both in the city and in its parts from elsewhere. It's uh, the very famous passage in book 3, 9. 
Uh, indeed, it seems that it is the idea of life that could well explain our passage as well. Passage on your uh, on la right hand. Why is the community that includes the other communities conceived as perfect? Certainly, the mere inclusion of more of the other parts does not necessarily lead to perfection. Indeed, often the opposite is the case. But the connection between the inclu inclusion of a greater number of parts in a given whole and the greater perfection of that whole in comparison with those parts certainly exists where different things having in themselves an inherent principle of organization, that is life, are also combined, that the resulting whole is also organized and living. The notion of life would thus be a good candidate for the thought connection of the opening argument. The relation between the perfection of a city and the good contained in it would thus be, from this point of view, the opposite of what is usually stated. It's the city is not perfect because it contains the highest good, it's the usual interpretation, but it contains the highest good because it includes other communities. At the heart of the statement is the notion of community, koinonia which is not an ethical notion, but a specifically political one. Hence, the statement that the, that the city is a community may have resonated strongly politically with contemporary readers. In contemporary political discourse, the term koinon was used in opposition to the term idion. In the background lies the actual question after the common interest, which played a central role not only in contemporary debates on democracy, but also in Plato's projects of the best constitution in the Republic and the laws. <coughs> this is a topic of uh, Francisco Lisi, of course. In all these contexts, koinon was given clear priority over idion, but the actual uh, philosophical debate into which Plato radically inserted himself by proposing the socialization of all that had hitherto been regarded as idion was about the question of the proper proportion of the two moments, idion and koinon. The use of the term koinonia in the very first sentence of the writing has a truly programmatic meaning and hides a double intention. The first intention is to motivate the contemporary listener by affirming, affirming the centrality of the pursuit of the common, of common, and ultimately to show that it, uh, uh, what is most common in the uh, to show that what is most common, the most common, is the city itself. The second, more scientific purpose, is to demonstrate a hierarchical system of different communities. In the subsequent interpretation of the gradual emergence of the city, the koinonia plays the role of a kind of axis of development. All the more primitive and less complex formations are koinonia, that is, collective associations based on the sharing of something in common, but which, at the same time, as they increase in complexity, are also characterized by a decreasing degree of intimacy, and thus, in fact, by a decrease in the degree of koinon, in the mutual relations of the members and an expansion of the sphere of idion, and the expansion of the sphere of idion, on the other hand. It is by this means that Aristotle succeeds in showing that koinon cannot be demanded for all forms of cohabitation as a general principle, which is to, pl uh, to apply as Plato wants it. Plato says uh, the koinon should be adopted as much as possible. In fact, with respect to different forms of cohabitation, it is ex expressed in different senses. The very first sentence, however, makes it clear that this ambiguity is a systematic one. The whole argument and its conclusion presuppose a certain semantic unity of the con con uh, concept, whereby from the fact that we see in every Koinonia, sorry, we can legitimately draw a conclusion for sovereign koinonia. It is likely that the focal meaning here is precisely the notion of the city, which represents the optimal measure of koinon when including a reasonable measure of idion. Thus we are presumably to read the statement that the city is the most sovereign of all and inclusive of all other communities, that is, as both inclusive and exclusive the two determinations are closely connected in the text by a grammatical link, and it is therefore likely that the substantive link is postulated here. The city is the most sovereign precisely because it is the most inclusive and thus contains the highest variety of different constellations of private and common. It may be said that Aristotle devotes the whole of Book I and also of Book II to the confirmation of his 
of this thesis. The city itself then normatively determines the criterion of proper socialization, of proper koinon, which must have a reasonable measure, but at the same time includes lower communities that exceed this measure and in which the measure of the common is almost absolute or such as Plato wished for the city. Aristotle shows in the very first sentence of the whole treatise that he knows how to resolve probably the most serious contemporary political dispute and moreover that this solution lies in the easy way, namely in a proper understanding of what a city is. The characterization of a city as a simultaneously sovereign is sufficient to justify that the city is distinct from the communities of which it is composed. At this basic level, therefore, it is already evident that it is a mistake to neglect the generic differences of these various koinoniae and their governments and their rules. It is precisely in relation to the diversity of koinoniae dominated at uh, the pre-political level, koinonia of men and uh, male and female, slave and uh, master, that the aspect of politeia is indicated in the present investigation. The distinction of governments at the household level leads to distinction of governments in the city, and this already implicitly involves the distinction of different regimes. This can be understood as an abstraction from the substantive aspect of the city and an exclusion of the eidetic aspect of politics. Uh, maybe, inclu maybe inclusion would be better, inclusion of the eidetic aspect of politics. However, this abstraction is not a reduction. All the analyses made in Book 1 are primarily concerned with the city, showing its nature and internal dynamics. As such, the city encompasses a variety <coughs> and at the same time a pleroma fullness of elements. It can be a place of happy life for its citizens. Book 1 of the politics all allows us to glimpse the city in each in, in this richness, therein lies the importance and unique value of this text in contemporary writing. So that much for the first book. I, I think it would be maybe too much to read all these evident, textual evidences. So maybe to make it easy, or, okay, it also depends on, uh, on our uh, time distribution. Is it okay? Please feel free to stop me if it's too much. Uh, okay, uh, so let's have a look at, at book, th uh, book two, the unity of the city and the constitution. A similar, though this time much more explicit unity of the two key elements of the political pragmatia is present in book two, our second passage. We propose to, to consider which form of association, that is the city, is best of all for persons able to live a life as close as possible to the ideal. So we must look at the other constitutions too, both those in use in certain of the cities that are reputed to be governed by good laws, and any others which we find set forth by anyone and are thought to be of good quality. Our purpose is to see what is right and useful in them, but also to avoid giving the impression that the search for something different from them is the result of a desire to be clever at all costs. Let it be thought rather that we have embarked on this mode of inquiry precisely because these constitutions currently existing are not of good quality. The aim of Aristotle sets himself, set him, uh, by himself at the outset is to make an investigation of the political community. Theores sai perites koinonias tes politices. With regard to the question which is best, kratiste, for people who are able to live as much as possible according to their wishes, literally according to prayer, kat euchen. The clarifying addition is a reference to the systematics of the constitution from politics for one where the best constitution in general is thus designated, and also to Plato's laws, of course, where whence it comes. Note that the political community or city is thus given its designation belonging originally and in the proper sense only to the constitution. 
Does Aristotle suggest a strong internal interdependence between the two terms? This interdependence is maintained throughout book, the whole book. The formulation of the opening sentence can be considered programmatic since it is a conscious attempt to link two different ways of speaking, <coughs> the traditional dis discourse of the polis as politeia and the proper conception of the polis as a certain contornia, specific koinonia. The relationship between polis and politeia seemed to Aristotle's predecessors to be entirely unproblematic. The polis is already given by the fact that it has a constitution and the constitution best expresses its political nature. As can be seen from the formulation of the first sentence, which identifies the two concepts, which complete obviousnesses, Aristotle incorporates this discourse into his own conception. If, however, we follow the announced intention in the further progress of Book 2 to show in what ways the present constitutions are not right, we find that the wrongness of the most wrong of the constitutions, namely that of Plato's Republic, of course, consists in the abolition of the city. Aristotle recognized that the political depends that the political depends on something even more substantial than the constitution, <laughs> something that itself has always been taken too self-evident to be the subject of scrutiny. In his diagnosis of misconceptions, he showed an even greater, bre greater breadth of scope than his teacher Plato, who at times also linked seemingly contradictory conceptions by pointing out their common erroneous assumption their common starting point this is the, uh, the case with the sophist and Eliots, who share the, uh, the basic metaphysical conception actually also aristotle's portrayal of the spectrum of mix misconception uh, misconceptions about constitutions ranges from the sophist questioning of law through plato's doctrine of politeia to the absolute abolition of the city in the undifferentiated nation in the background background each time stands the unreflected reduction of the polis to politeia, understood as nomos, harmony, structure of the soul, etc. That is a lack of understanding of the irre irreducibility of the phenomenon of polis. And now to book three, the city as a perquisite for the scientific investigation of the constitution. The close connection of polis and politeia is valid even in the part of politics, in that part of politics that is over otherwise famous for its insights into constitutional doctrine, namely in Book 3. Famous passage from the very beginning. In the study of constitutions and of the nature and character of each constitution, almost the first thing to ask is what is the city? What is a city? For people dispute whether a certain act was an act of the city or not of the city, but of the oligarchy, oligarchy or of the tyrant. And we see that the politician and the legislator are entirely concerned with the city, while the constitution is a certain ordering of those inhabiting the city. <coughs> the pair of questions this and poiatis, that's the nature and character here in this uh, translation, belongs to the typical <coughs> arsenal of Socratic Platonic questioning. And Aristotle uses it heavily in other works. This correspondence with Platonic methodology, however, means nothing more than that from, uh, than that from uh, their Plato draws tool suitable for his own quite distinctive investigation. The opening sentence shows a conscious distance from Plato's conception. Aristotle first abandons the announced academic question after the nature and quality of the constitution in favor of the question, what is a city, the Estenhead police. Also, the form of the question is also, of course, Socratic Platonic. Its content and scope are original. Aristotle holds, as he does in Book 2, that the scientific investigation of the Constitution cannot be undertaken in isolation from the question after the city. And the answer is also originally Aristotelian. Aristotle, in his account of the current contemporary dispute over the identity of the city, where people disagree whether the city or the oligarchy or tyrant did the deeds, clearly prefers the former, it was the city. He states that the politician and the legislator focus on the city and on constitution, which is a certain ordering of those inhabiting the city, as we read already. The politician and the legislator are thus to look at the thing itself and not merely at its form, the constitution, and which is, which is derived from the thing. At the same time, 
the thing, city, under examination is defined as broadly as possible by the politically elementary fact of inhabiting a place. In the background is the conception of the city as a fullness to which all inhabitants belong, including slave, slaves and foreigners, that is the city as the totality of all the means and conditions of self-sufficiency. At the point of question, in question, this is not to be understood as a nod to the perspective of the preceding sections, but rather as a purposeful antithesis to the conception that identifies the city with the con constitution. The first definition of a city, city is a certain number of citizens, is then a further step in the preliminary conceptual clarification where on the one hand, in contrast to the concept of the city reduced to the constitution, the basis of the city as a totality is assumed. On the other hand, the whole from which Aristotle's own concept of the constitution is derived, derived and on which it depends, is narrowed down and conceived as a composite of citizens. The relation of whole and part of city and citizens, thus legally conceived, which determines the whole of the uh, following inquiry, is then not a parallel, but a conscious substitute for the platonic analogy of city and soul. The connection to the uh, uh, initial and fundamental understanding of the city as a fullness is then provided by the second definition of the city. City is, to put it simply, a number of such persons large enough for self-sufficiency of life. The whole is here, as in the previous assessment, assessments, uh, composed not of all inhabitants, but only of citizens. However, the determination of their quantity using the concept of self-sufficiency, uh, which according to political one, two represents the limit uh, of the city, again evokes the aforementioned fundamental continuity and hence the dependence of constitutional doctrine on fundamental polemics. By contrast, in the third already mentioned definition of the city as a community of citizens under a constitution, the emphasis is again on the legal formal side of things. In addition to the formal institutional perspective, which is the focus of the vast majority of commentators, a different type of argumentation comes to the fore in the third book, which instead of emphasize, emphasizing <coughs> normative and formal considerations, emphasize the second fundamental aspect of the political city as a fullness. The notion of the city as fullness serves in later examinations of the book to refute the contractual conception of the city which abolishes the city as such. Here are subtle points to the hidden connection between this conception, Plato's concern for the exclusive unity of the city, and the hegemonic tendencies in contemporary politics which in effect reduce the city to a household. I think the uh, next uh, passage can be omitted, so I skip to, to the last passage in the book Seven, the best constitution and the best life in the city. Aristotle opens the inquiry into the best system, best regime, in the same way as Plato in the laws, by asking the question about the end. Quotation, if we wish to in investigate the best constitution appropriately, we must first decide what is the most desirable life. For if we do not know that, the best constitution is also bound to elude us. For those who live under the best ordered constitution, so far as their circumstances allow, may be expected, bearing accidents, to be those whose affairs proceed best. We must therefore first come to some agreement as to what is the most desirable life for all men, or nearly all, and then decide whether it is one and the same life that is most desirable for them both as individuals and in the mass, or different ones. At the heart of the programmatic statement is the assumption that the best constitution is systematically linked to the best life for men. Those who lead the best life as citizens under given conditions are to have the best life. If we accept the assumption that the people living in the best political conditions must have the best life, then the following procedure applies to the search for the best constitution. Let us imagine people having a good time and ask what their political conditions must be. The best life is then given as a postulate and the main consideration is directed to the conjecture of those constitutional conditions under which its realization is possible. 
For this conjecture, however, it is also necessary to know the content of the best life. The best constitution and the best life are thus linked from the beginning. To investigate the best constitution, one must know the good life. But the good life will be shown by the fact that people will live happily in the city. The two concepts are only distinguished methodologically and for the purposes of investigation. Therefore, when Aristotle at the end of the quoted section extends the knowledge of the content of the best life to the question of whether the same life is more desirable both for all together and privately for each, he wants to test what is assumed from the beginning, the connection between the good of the city and the person. The most desirable life implies a question for the best life, Aristezoe, and the adjective best in turn implies a question for the good, about the good. In particular, Aristotle contrasts the spiritual goods on the one hand and the bodily goods and external goods on the other and gives a number of arguments for the priority of the former for happiness. He finds decisive proof, the decisive proof in, in God who is happy and blissful from within, not from without, internally, not externally. It is his activity that shows the priority of inner manifestation over, over outer, uh, outer ones, equivalent to the difference between happiness and happy accident. The life of God thus gives us a glimpse of the nature of an inward-oriented life. This conclusion would certainly su not surprise the readers of Aristotle's ethics, the very, maybe readers of Aristotle's metaphysics. The very next statement, however, open, opens up a whole new dimension, quotation, related to death and following the same logic is that even the best city is happy and doing well. Thus, even in the happiness of the city, the inner connection with its goodness is repeated and at the same time the difference between the inside and outside that we recognize in God. This is a political theolo theology of a particular type. The police can be like a god when it lives from itself. This argument will be used in the next chapter, chapter to refute the despotic conception of politics and lawmaking. However, it seems to transcend this immediate purpose in its gravity and significance. What emerges before us is an explicit three or four part parallel of God, polis or politeia and man which guarantees the unity of political and individual life and happiness. We see then that even at the beginning of the book, which of all the politics most closely follows Plato's conception of the best constitution, this very question is immediately tied to the substantive question of life and city. And now to conclude. Singling out the city as a separate scientific problem takes the investigation of political life to a new level, as it raises the need to establish a separate pra pragmatia <coughs> with its own method and perspective for selecting relevant facts. The significance of this fact is inestimable and should be remembered when evaluating any attempt to interpret Aristotle's politics as dependent on his either natural philosophy or ethics. In Aristotle's decision to develop a separate pragmatia for the political problem, one can see the clear, clearest evidence that he would have rejected su such dependence. Politics is not reducible to its form, order or philosophical knowledge or political knowledge, but must focus on its substantial object, which is the polis, which is itself a quasi-substantial reality. We saw that it's uh, even a godlike reality. This brings into play the political life in its complexity, which involves all sorts of relations and interactions and makes the city also a religious community. Hand in hand with this also goes the expansion of the audience of the newly established pragmatia to embrace a wider circle of listeners, including potential politicos, politicians, perhaps. The fullness of the political sphere has its source in the substantive focus on life, which is constituted <coughs> in the interaction, interactions of parts of the city. This is true even though it may be appropriate from a certain perspective for such a complex science to look also at the form of political life, that is, at the constitution. 
in the opening passages of all the political mini pragmatei of the politics, Aristotle makes the desired unity of the key concepts of political theory, that is, the community, uh, political community and the constitution, the basic premise of all subsequent inquiry. This unity must be neither a reduction of one concept to the other, nor an identification of both. Its examination is based on the convi conviction that the best state of the constitution is correlate of the political community, the city. This explains why Aristotle political science, and after him all subsequent political science, all books of political science, ultimately involve or a pair of complementary, though often difficult to reconcile tasks, a focus on the normative, legitimizing, and potentially polemical question of the state as such. So obviously very polemical, including uh, questions like uh, sovereignty or state of emergency, for instance. And on the other hand, the empirical question of the plurality and diversity of political forms. A book of political science that simultaneously grows out of the tradition of the politeia, but is given decisive impetus by an anti-intellectualist and anti-platonic critique, contains this fullness of impulses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Aristotelian politics. They, uh, I think there are a lot of questions <laughs> to discuss. <laughs> and, uh, okay, I, I, I confess I must read that again because you uh, offer a lot of fundamental questions about the politics, beginning with the unity of it and also about the relationship between what you call uh, politeia and polis. Please, uh, I don't know, Manuel. Yeah, is that on? Yeah, it is on? OK. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jakub. I was never really convinced that, that Aristotle is the founder of political science. Um, <laughs> I think that's, you know, these are obviously <laughs> difficult question, but I think Plato is a much better candidate. And let's talk about a little bit your, your arguments. You said like Plato is just focusing on the politeia, but, but like for Aristotle makes the polis as the specific object of inquiry. And I think we could make your argument even stronger. You, you didn't mention politics book one, chapter two, um, which I think is really, uh, you know, he really analyzes the, the, the polis, and he says, yeah, man and woman, master and slave, and implicitly uh, man and children. Um, and I think also when he says, <coughs> with his argument that man is by nature a political animal, I think that is also, it's a, of course a very disputed topic. What does he mean with malon uh, then? But I think he wants to distinguish the polis from, from the beehive and and the until, so I think he wants to say that the, the, the polis, the human polis, is, is, is a specifically human um, koinonia, which is about the good, the just, uh, the, the sumferon, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we can make the argument even stronger, but it still doesn't <laughs> con convince me, because I think we find this already in Plato. Uh, let's look at the Republic, where he a also examines the polis. He, he says, what is, what, why does the polis start historically? He says, Kreia, need. People have the need. So he, he's examining the polis. He's also talking, uh, he's defining also the polis by autarkeia, by self-sufficiency, which we find also in Paul <coughs> 1, 2. And, and you know, he also talks about uh, normative questions. Is the family good in the polis? Or we, we need more unity uh, in, the, in the polis, so we have to abolish. Uh, the family. So I think also Plato is, is, is examining uh, the polis as such and, and the argument that kind of Plato is only uh, or, or mainly, let's say, focusing on the politeia isn't 
uh, as Aristotle defines the politeia as the order uh, that determines who rules in the polis, isn't the politeia such a central element of the polis? So I don't see uh, what, 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 what <laughs> distinguishes uh, uh, Aristotle so much that we could say he's the first and, and not Plato. And, and a, a little, a second point, mm -hmm. uh, I, I was also not very convinced, and I don't know where you, uh, what, what you're basing this on, that you says book one and two, three of the polis is more addressed to a wider audience, right? Mm -hmm. Compared to, to books four to, four to exactly, six. Exactly, mm. four to four is more like esoteric, more, I wrote it down, you said the inner circle, right? <coughs> These were mm -hmm. the terms you, you used in your mm -hmm. paper, but, but, but so why do you make such a distinction? I mean, you know, the stasis uh, is such an important topic. You know, the, the, he's in book six, the, the oligarchy and, and, and democracy. These are the constitutions of, of Aristotle's time. The second part of book four, the, 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 the polity, the politeia as a mixed uh, constitution, as a way to reform existing democracies and oligarchies, are these not the most pressing question of Aristotle's time? So why do you say this? One is esoteric and the other one is exoteric, so I thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It's obviously, if I start from, from, the, uh, from the second question, it's ob obviously a matter of, of measure. So I'm, I'm speaking uh, ab about the weight of uh, aspects, aspect of esoteri uh, esotericity and, and uh, exotericity. And in this sense, it doesn't uh, it doesn't play a role what uh, what topic uh, do you, uh, do you f are you focusing on? If you focus on a, on a very uh, uh, very strong um, uh, very touching problem of uh, of uh, stasis of a revolution or or disputes in the, in the city, it doesn't mean that uh, that you speak to everybody. It might be that precisely for uh, for uh, controversy of this of, of this topic, you limit yourself to speak only to persons who can understand you properly. I think that your argument would be would go for uh, for my position. Uh, and obvi and obviously, uh, I I would insist uh, on a specific uh, methodology used in books four to six, which uh, which uh, uh, reminds us of uh, Aristotelian. Uh, theoretical philosophy, of course, partly metaphysics, partly partly is biology or natural philosophy, which is also something which is not very accessible to to wider audience. And I think also this uh, general structure of uh, let's say dual logic, which is behind it, uh, which is also behind the uh, the phenomenon of of stasis. But you still have only dual uh, pol pol politics could uh, could be reduced. To uh, to binary logic, but the precondition for this reduction is that you understand it deeply from the point of view of your metaphysics, and it again makes uh, makes this topic, this subject, very much limited to only those who are really good in in philosophy. You can hardly uh, persuade uh, a man of politics, a common man of politics, common citizen, that uh, that politics works like this. That really politics is about a struggle between poor and and wealthy. It's something uh, which presupposes much, and we if we understand this, we understand we, we tend to put uh, uh, the basic uh, ba basic uh, political polemics in these terms. It's because we have this uh, di this uh, breadth history of of political thought. We we have these instruments like political parties. They help us somehow. To uh, to understand or to uh, to instrumentalize this metaphysical logic be behind it, it's it's quite a big reduction to divide people left or right. But we know that it functions somehow; it works, so we do it. But we need this instrument, this uh, this terminology, and uh, this this more uh, uh, more profound instruments in terms of political science. So did did, did we? Uh, another, uh, on the other hand, I, I was speaking about books four to six. If you take book one, for instance, as a representative of these, let's say, uh, uh, scriptures that are closer to a wider audience, let's say, then consider the number of quotations from poets, for example. 
it's obviously an aspect of exotericity. You, need, you, you address a uh, uh, general, general uh, uh, educated audience who is uh, fluent in, in Homer, so to speak. So th these would be my, my reasons. And the first question is, of course, more, much more serious. <laughs> Uh, I would say it's again. Uh, I, I would distinguish it uh, based on uh, on motivation. Obviously, there are uh, the uh, the uh, the topic is there, or the material for this uh, political pragmatia is there already in in Plato. Obviously, I would also add to your uh, uh, examples. I would also add the question of the book five of of the republic of course all all these problem problems uh, around wim, women in politics and the role of private pop private prop property and private families and so on these aspects are aspects of of life i would say and it's uh, no coincidence that these aspect aspects play a key role in uh, establishing a theory of natural law obviously we don't have a natural law in, in Plato, we don't have natural law in Aristotle, but we, we have a material there, which can be adopted by, by later authors, by San Augustine and, and medieval authors. And it's precisely uh, as with the whited quotation about Plato, th there is everything there and we can only comment it. But the question is what we select as our main focus. And I would claim that for Plato, there was no, uh, there was no foc uh, interesting focus uh, in the city itself. City is being as a substance which is godlike and which, uh, which we should take as, uh, uh, as something which we, we should imitate. Uh, there is a obviously a, a, a question of, of the police, but taken as, at the same goes also for these problems like women and, and property, uh, this all is taken as a necessary condition, as a realm of ananki. Ananki inputs into politics from this perspective. And you somehow have to resolve problems which, which are connected to, to ananki. But the basic instrument you have in hand is the form. Form which is coextensive, a correlative to the knowledge the same uh, form is in your mind, obviously. This is, uh, okay, it's rather about metaphysics in, uh, in Plato, but uh, th this eidetic mo moment plays a crucial role. And as you can remember, everything depends on if this eidetic uh, uh, element uh, uh, succeeds. If you, if you look at, the, at this passage about the philosopher kings, you see that it's a necessary and a sufficient condition for all the other pro political problems, of solving, resolving of, of all political problems. Just if you succeed in elevating philosophers to this role, then everything is okay. That's precisely this limitation and this reductionism, this uh, conviction that it really, uh, oh, it, oh, what, uh, what, uh, what is really important is the question, uh, is the question of, of Eidos and, uh, and the role of Eidos in politics. Power. Yes, again, from 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 from, from the other perspective. From, yes, <coughs> connection of, of power and ados, of course. Yes, that, that, that's a paradoxical connection. Yes, it is. And by the way, it's also uh, also connection which goes against the very uh, 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 very prior. Uh, concept or principle of the, of the whole poli uh, of the whole republic because justice is uh, oikopragia obviously and this is not oikopragia it's not doing one's own it's doing two different things one of which is not your own it's stated explicitly the, f the philosopher is not here to do politics he is pushed to do it but it's not his his activity so thank you thank you very much there is another question there, so please. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Jan, hmm? for your question. Ah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so thank you, Yako. Mm -hmm. And related to my first question, uh, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering about your kind of uh, treatment of Aristotle's politics as a kind of, uh, you know, 
uh, focusing on police as an independent you know, subject matter. Mm -hmm. So for example, you refer to book seven, uh, politics, uh, kind of, you know, uh, there is a, a kind of platonic connotation of Aristotle's parallel between city and individuals. And also, you know, a city in Aristotle is a little bit very ethical notion. So it's on uh, cities, you know, established for good life and good order, uh, well-being and uh, living together. So and that you know statement appears in book three and in book one as well. So uh, pol pol police, uh, you know, city is not so independent. At least you know conceptually not independent. Uh, it's uh, rather you know dependent on the notion of you know good life you know, uh, living together, friendship, etc. So ju just, you know, I'm wondering about, you know, whether, uh, how to treat, you know, mm. <laughs> that, you know, material. Mm. Yes, uh, yes, you are, yeah, yes, yes, you, you, you are absolutely, absolutely right. If, if I claim that, uh, that the police is independent topic, then it, it, it wouldn't be right, of course. It's not independent in the sense that it has no connection to, 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 other, to, to other concepts. And uh, the question is rather, to which concept the, con uh, the connection is uh, is important? I would say that uh, such a concept would be life. Pol police is a, c can be described as a place for, for for living of certain people, certain gr groups of people, and in this sense, you can hardly explain what uh, what the police is without uh, indicating something about life. So I I agree. So methodologically, there is inter interdependence, obviously. And even you can say that uh, uh, there is dependence on, uh, on certain concepts in me metaphysics, such as this duality, this dual logics, or, or the logic of mean, of, co of the mean, of course. So you, can, you, you cannot avoid them. And I hope I, 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 I didn't say that, that uh, the concept of, pol of police is independent. I even claim that it's some some interwoven with with the concept of 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 politeia. But the 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 thing is that you can start uh, research in political affairs focusing solely on 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 the policy itself. You don't need necessarily this intermediate uh, instrument of of uh, of politeia. Okay. Is there another question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Jakub, for uh, your presentation. I think that uh, it has been the best way to open our conference on the book of political science, because you spoke precisely on the problem of the definition of uh, politics uh, within a book or something with a coherent structure like, uh, more or less, uh, the Aristotelian politics. Um, I think that um, it's very interesting to insist on the pragmatic skills of the political knowledge. And uh, I agree with you in, uh, in general. Uh, for example, on the possibility to distinguish the audience of the first uh, and the second part uh, in, uh, within politics. Uh, for example, uh, it can be uh, useful for you an investigation by Delba Winthrop uh, who published in 2019 a book whose title is Aristotle, Democracy and Political Science Chicago, London 2019 uh, because mm, it's not a very original book um, neither the, the author uh, dedicates uh, the investigation to the problem of uh, exoterical, esoterical uh, writings. Uh, nevertheless, uh, she observed uh, some changes, stylistic changes, uh, in the manner in Aristotle offers topics uh, about uh, political regimes uh, and constitutions in the second part of the treatise. For example, she analyzes uh, um, the presence of exclamations, mm. Madia, Matus Theus, uh, and uh, observes that uh, this is a particular um, uh, ethical, uh, sentimental, affective dimension of Aristotle. 
uh, I repeat, she mm, does not refer this uh, stylistic distinction inside the politics to the esoterical, mm -hmm. esoterical production, but maybe it's, uh, it's something useful for, for you. Thank you. Uh, on the other end, uh, mm, uh, the problem of uh, the linguistic problem, uh, Plato, Aristoteles, who was the real founder of <laughs> political science, maybe it can sound as uh, a trivial perspective, but I think that the grammatical dimension is, uh, is useful to, um, uh, to, to divide and order the problem because platonic reflection is centered on uh, a group of nouns, very clear, politeia, cosmos. On the contrary, the problem of the Aristotelian writing is that it's centered on the adjective politicos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is, mm, this is quite problematic because uh, uh, every time I, I read these pages, uh, um, my question is, which is the implied, the implied term mm -hmm. uh, referred to the adjective? Because for example, in the first page of Nicomachean Ethics, uh, there is a definition of politics uh, as the architectonique mm. episteme. Yeah. Mm. Architectonique episteme. Mm. But mm, more than the, 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 the quality of the definition, is important the noun implied episteme, mm. science. In other cases, uh, um, not necessarily politique or the adjective politicos <laughs> inside the politics uh, implies uh, so, uh, politique. Mm. Because can be, for example, tecne mm. or arete. Mm. So I think that uh, mm, the, the distinction uh, starting from uh, grammar uh, and the use uh, by Aristotle of the adjective instead of a noun complicated very much the, the discussion. Uh, in fact, in medieval tradition, um, often commentators and authors refer to this Aristotelian treatise as uh, uh, Aristotelis Politeia. Mm. But the title is not Politeia, mm. of course. It's, it's another. Uh, mm. In the case of rhetoric, for example, it's quite clear, I don't know if Silvia uh, will agree with me, uh, rhetorique, another adjective, but mm -hmm. the noun implied is tecne. Mm -hmm. In the case of the politics, it's not, mm, not the same, mm -hmm. because the title change, and the very problem is the origin of these titles in, uh, mm -hmm. in, in late antiquity. In the manuscript tradition, we have no variations Always the reference is uh, Aristotelus ton politicon proton protos deuteros mm, with respect to the to the book. Mm. I don't know. Um, yes, thank uh, you very much. It's obviously, I, I try to somehow to uh, to tackle it also in in, in my paper. Uh, he's shy to use uh, the the uh, the substantive uh, polis. On, uh, very. Uh, uh, very rarely he speaks directly about politics. It's, it, it's, it's paradoxical if I at the same time claim that he's a founder of political science based on his focus on police. But precisely this is behind it and uh, th this, are, uh, this is another, another set of problems and the question why it is so. Maybe also a po uh, actual politics play a role in it because he o of course writes in times when the police is in decline in a sense, in, in, in po uh, politically. And I, I'm uh, convinced that, that his uh, second chapter of the first book, and I al already present my, my ideas, I don't know, five years ago here, uh, about the second chapter of the first book, where on my view there is a hidden criticism of ma Macedonian poli uh, policy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> with, with this tendency to destroy, d destroy this fundamental framework of political life. And I think the uh, the key clubs that, we, uh, that I mentioned there are uh, is a uh, indi indication of of Macedonians. Uh, okay, so maybe th there are several problems, even these strategic uh, 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 considerations, and of course, but I think these uh, adjectives are more powerful than than substantives. Of 
course. So if he uses sub, uh, adjectives, it's even more interesting for us. And again, connected with this fact that, that Merbeke didn't translate precisely these adjectives. So on one hand, you have Cicero, who is able to speak about civitas with, with, without any problems. On the other hand, you, you have authors who, uh, who have problems to translate the very same adjective based on the very same uh, substantive. It's no chance. It's, uh, it's intentional, and there is some uh, con congenial idea be behind this in uh, interpretation. And we are, uh, we are grateful to them, because th that's why we have this terminology. We speak about politics, and we understand, and we also understand how difficult it is. If you consider, for example, this attribution, the, the very attribution to, uh, to, uh, to the work, work of writing, you, you say uh, there, is a, uh, there is a politicum biblion, for example. What does it mean? Politique uh, or, or ta, ta politica, these, these, these are political affairs, affairs of power, of, of struggle, of, uh, of, uh, of many en en enmities, and, and, so, and so on. And suddenly you decide to, dip, uh, to describe a book by it. Does it mean that, that this book is a, uh, is a piece of politics? Does the book make politics? So th th there, there must have been a consideration behind this decision to describe a book as a political book. It's not, it's not uh, so clear and obvious. So I'm very uh, interested in, in, in this set of problems. So thank you very much for this. OK, is there another question? Then if, may I put my questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, good, I, I think, no, I was thinking about the uh, politica, singular to politicum. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I think Aristotle speak about politique, episteme, or technique. There is a distinction. This is also in, by, by, in Plato. You have the same problem. It's very difficult to distinguish. Practically, uh, they are used synonymously. Mm. No? But I have a um, problem with uh, your interpretation of the different logo in the politics, because I would say there are continuous references to other books. From those books that you would say are esoteric to the books that are not esoteric, and the same thing. And they are, the, as apparently, and this is what I think that already journeys in his uh, review of uh, Jäger said, apparently wanted Aristotle that this book should be considered or, be, or read as a unity. And this is an important point because if the author thinks that the book should be read or understood as uh, understand, understand as, as uh, a unity, why should we change or pe think that there are different levels, different <coughs> layers, or as you want, or different audiences? Uh, it's a bit difficult to... Uh, to I would say there is, a, there, there is not another possibility. Yeah. If, if I uh, remember correctly, the, uh, these references are on one, only one-sided. There are references from, uh, from books four to six to the so-called Jägerin uh, uh, no. or politic. No. I have finished, just finished the translation. Okay. <laughs> so forget it's this. More, much but more, anyway, much more general, yes. Even without this, uh, <laughs> without this argument, I, I would say that uh, y you can simply make references uh, among your students to, to, to the parts yeah. wi which are wi more widely known. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, okay. yes, and possible. possible. Yes. But of course, so I share with you this, this basic understanding of, of these books, of ancient authors, as, as unities, yeah. as unities of a sort. Yeah. But if I want, n I don't want to be simply too naive to, uh, to overlook m important differences. There are yeah. some. And I would say better than to shift different parts yeah. or say, uh, Aristotle uh, was mistaken here, and then he corrected him himself, and so I think it's better to presuppose that there is a unity, there is a doctrinal unity, 
but present it in different ways. Oh, yeah. That would be my, my position. As we are <laughs> so why not... Oh. Thank you. Why not refer to the beginning of book four, where he says one and the same signs yes. has four different perspectives yes, and four different tasks of investigation. Aren't these four different perspectives kind of something that puts <laughs> the, the eight books of the politics together, whatever, like the Kat Ochin is like book seven and book eight, and mm -hmm. what is like the best constitution for most cities is referring to four to six, because you can combine uh, oligarchia and democratia and make a mixed constitution out of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. The, 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 it continues my, my argument, actually, because these, mo the, uh, on my view, the most esoteric parts, the, the most closed parts, which is the fir fourth book, um, uh, 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 can refer to, to, to anything, anything else. So it's the, uh, it's the passage where you can also summarize as, a, as an author and to point out what, what is, and or differentiate the, differentiate the different methods or different pragmatism. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Very thank interesting, you. very fruitful. I, sh I have already said I, sh I have to read that again. It, and um, a very interesting paper on Aristotle's politics attacking different labels and problems. Okay, thank you very much thank you. for your paper. Okay, welcome uh, everybody to this uh, second session uh, the morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michele, Kurtis, for all the organization of this uh, amazing um, meeting of the Collegium Politicum. I have the great honor to present the next three uh, speakers, starting uh, with uh, Professor uh, Silvia Gastaldi, uh, an, an old friend of the Collegium as well. <laughs> One of the founders. <laughs> One of the founders <laughs> as well. Francisco Lisi. Uh, <laughs> uh, with Francisco Lisi uh, <laughs> from the very beginning of the times. Um, <laughs> professor Gastaldi uh, has been uh, for many years a professor in, professor in ancient philosophy in the University of Pavia, and uh, she has been dealing with uh, different topics in, uh, in antiquity, among which, of course, Aristotle, uh, especially politics, uh, rhetoric, um, and among that, other topics. And uh, I'm very pleased to give her the word now. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this uh, very kind uh, presentation. Uh, we, uh, you can yeah, uh, I follow roll, roll the, the, uh, my handout uh, collection of texts that uh, I'm quoting uh, during uh, my talk. In chapter two of, uh, of book one of the rhetoric, Aristotle writes, I quote, rhetoric is a kind of offshoot on dialectic and ethical studies, which is, to, is just to call politics. I use the translation by Cairns Lord. I'm oh, oh, sorry, <laughs> it's for politics. For rhetoric, I use the translation of uh, George Kennedy uh, on a rhetoric, uh, a theory of civic discourse. The term translated as offshoot is the Greek paraphues. Citing Cope's commentary, Paraphues properly denotes either a branch or a separate plant growing alongside of the parent plant and proceeding either from the stem or the root as a scion or offshoot, end of the quotation. Therefore, Aristotle uses a botanical metaphor to indicate the relationship between rhetoric and the two other disciplines that is dialectic and political science. I will la deal later with the dialectic with which rhetoric sh uh, shares demonstrative tools. In this talk, I will primarily focus on the relationship between rhetoric and politics to clarify the meaning of the paraphues metaphor. Defining rhetoric as an offshoot of political science, Aristotle aims 
to underline not only the similarities, but also the differences between the two disciplines. First of all, I will highlight the differences. I should be remembered that in uh, the Greek city, rhetoric is the tool by which politicians <laughs> dominate the assembly. This is why Aristotle writes in the same chapter two that rhetoric disguises itself as politics and wears its mask. We see here a reference to Plato's Gorgias where rhetoric is a form of flattery that creeps underneath politics. Aristotle aims to keep rhetoric, which is a technique for studying persuasive arguments, apart from politics, which is a science. After all, in chapter two of book one, text number two of the Nicomachean Ethics, he clearly states that rhetoric, along with the strategy and economics, must be subordinate to political science, which is the architectonic science, that is the science playing a leading role with respect to all sciences and activities within the city. What about the similarities? To answer this question, in the rhetoric we have to analyze the treatment of the kind of speech called deliberative, symboleuticon. Its purpose is to advise and to dissuade, that is to propose to the citizen in the assembly the choices must, most useful and to persuade them to avoid the harmful ones. It's no coincidence that deliberative speech is defined by Aristotle as more beautiful and more political than speeches concerning private affairs. At the same time, he underlines that the authors of the rhetorical handbooks only dealt with judicial speeches, giving plenty of space to strategies to arouse the compassion of judges. Aristotle sharply criticizes the practice in chapter one of the book one, at the very beginning of this treatise. Why has the deliberative kind of speech never been dealt with in rhetorical handbooks? According to Aristotle, the reason is that it's more difficult to deliver a speech in the assembly than in the law courts. In the assembly, in fact, it's not possible to speak of what is outside the subject, and expertise on it is required. The treatment of deliberative kind of speech, which begins in chapter four of book one, of the rhetoric shows what the expertise of the rhetorician speaking in the assembly should be. Notably, in this passage, the verb eidenai, to know, recurs several times. We know the list of subjects Aristotle examines through the political speeches that have come down to us. He is evidently familiar with these uh, speeches and takes them as a starting point for his treatment. Let us take a closer examination of the chapter. In the opening lines, Aristotle states that it's only possible to deliberate on what depends on us. The same theme is developed extensively in book three of the Nicomachean Ethics, where Aristotle treats deliberation as a component of action, that is, as an evaluation of the means by which, by which an action to be, can be accomplished. Before listing the main subject of deliberation, that is, finances, war and peace, defense of the country, imports and exports and the legislation, Aristotle clearly says that these are political subjects and it's therefore up to political science 
to know them in depth. Right here, he repeats what he already said in chapter two, namely that rhetoric is only a faculty of finding persuasive arguments. Rhetorique, as to the rhetorique, dynamis perie caston tu theoresa ito and the common on pizza non. Despite this statement, the analysis of the fine main, five main subjects of deliberation is very broad. Text number four. First of all, Aristotle deals with city finances. Always, and especially in uh, the fourth century, the economy is the political problem par excellence. After the defeat in the Pel Peloponnesian War and the failure of the Second Maritime League as well, Athens faces a severe financial crisis. Significantly, it was at this time that Xenophon wrote his work Poroi to indicate the means by which the city's revenue could be improved. Aristotle states that the rhetorician, rhetorician must know the necessary and superfluous resources, but this is not enough. One must research historicon einai, also the means adopted in the financial field by other peoples. The second subject concerns peace and war. Here again, the rhetorician has to know not only the city's military power, but also that of neighboring peoples. Aristotle's view is realistic. It is necessary to maintain peace with stronger people, peoples and to subdue <coughs> the weaker ones. However, it is necessary to know the course of both the wars fought by the city and those fought by other peoples and to study what out outcome they had. The third subject is the protection of the country. And also in this regard, the speaker has to know the number and strength of the soldiers who can defend the city and their location in the country. The fourth subject is the import and export of goods. This too is a crucial problem for the city because its soil doesn't produce all that is needed. Imports, especially grain, are necessary. Aristotle stresses the need to make uh, treaties and agreements with peoples, peoples that can provide food. In this regard, Demosthenes' speech against leptinus reports the clauses of the treaty between Athens and the Bosphorus king Leucon for the import of grain from the Black Sea area. Another, an, another important testimony about the problems of grain importation and Athenians' concern for food supply is Lysias' speech against the grain dealers regarding dealers who violated the laws regulated grain trade. In the ancient city, the economy is, to use Karl Polanyi's words, embedded in politics. The fifth and final subject of public speech, and perhaps the most important one, is legislation. As we read in this chapter, laws ensure the safety of the city. For Aristotle, as for all Greeks, law plays a central role. In the politics, Aristotle states that without laws there can be no politeia, that is, no political organization, and it, this is the case with tyranny. In this passage of the rhetoric, Aristotle stresses the link between law and politeia, the rhetorician must know the laws, but also the constitutions. Here, Aristotle gives no definition of politeia. In the politics, instead, we find many definitions of politeia, which is the key concept 
in uh, these treaties. For example, in Book 3, Chapter 1, Politeia is uh, defined uh, as the form of arrangement, the term is always taxes, of the inhabitants of a city, with reference to the community, including those residents we are we, who are not citizens. Later, in Chapter 6, Politeia is defined as uh, the arrangement of the city with respect to the, its uh, offices, taxes, tonarcon. In this passage, the city is understood in a strictly political sense, that is, as a community of citizens. As regards constitutions, in the passage of chapter 4, we read a kind of index of the theory of constitution outlined in the politics. Aristotle says that rhetoricians must know how many are the form of constitution, what are the favorable conditions for each, and what are the natural causes of his, its corruption. But here, Aristotle only briefly deals with the corruption of constitution. In Book 5 of the Politics, which is entirely devoted to the analysis of Metabole Politeion, he says is that, I quote, one should grasp what condition men are in when they engage in factional conflict, for the sake of what they do so, and thirdly, what the beginning points are of political disturbances and of factional conflicts, metabolai, caestases, among one another. And in fact, in Book 5 of Politics, he <coughs> analyzes in depth all these issues. In this passage of rhetoric, he only deals with two types of corruption, corruption by relaxation and corruption of the tension by the tension of the principle on which the constitution is based. Aristotle gives the example of democracy, which is based on equality. Relaxing the principle of equality of all citizens means the equo that equality diminishes and the superiority of the rich and the noble is recognized. As a result, democracies, democracy becomes an oligarchy. If, on the contrary, the principle of, of equality is taken to excess, that is, everyone is equal in everything, the government gener degenerates into anarchy, in which everyone does what he wants, as in Book 8 of uh, Plato's uh, uh, Republic. Regarding legislation, Aristotle adds that it's useful to know the constitution of other peoples, suited to their characters, in order to get this information, especially with regard to Eastern people, reports of travelers are helpful. Although Aristotle doesn't not specifically mention them, there, uh, I think these are authors such as uh, Ecateus of Miletus, Silax of Carianda, Caron of Lamp Lampsacus, Xanthus of uh, Sardis, who are considered the sources for Herodotus' histories. At the end of this review, Aristotle repeats that research, uh, also in this case, historia, on these subjects, is the domain of politics and not of rhetoric. Immediately afterward, however, at the conclusion of chapter 4, Aristotle reiterates that on these subjects, the rhetorician must have the premises, that is, the arguments to compose his speeches. Aristotle takes up again the subjects of politics and in particular the subject of constitution in chapter 8 of book 1, text number 
five. This chapter two seems to be a summary in a very simplified form of the entire theory of constitution outlined in the politics. Here Aristotle reiterates that the task of deliberative rhetoric is to advise and to dissuade. In this passage, he argues that the most important and effective means of persuasion <coughs> is to know all the forms of constitution, the customs, the institutions, and the interests of each of them. Citizens look first, Aristotle says, at what is advantageous, at what is advantageous per service the constitution. Here, Aristotle is merely giving a series of definitions useful for the rhetorician to compose his speeches. The relationship between the constitutions and the interests of citizens instead is analyzed in the politics, where Aristotle explains that a constitution is established when one group of citizens prevails over another group in order to safeguard their interest. This is the case of democracy and oligarchy in, uh, in Book 4 of the Politics. Even with regard to the Curion, that is the supreme power in the city, in the rhetoric, Aristotle Mary says that it changes according to different constitutions, while in the politics the attribution of the curion, referred to also as to politeuma, is an issue that plays a central role in Book 3. In fact, in chapters 10 to 13, Aristotle examines in depth the question as to whether this power should be held by, I quote, either the multitude, plezos, the wealthy, plusioi, the respectable, a PA case, or the one who is the best of all, or the tyrant. Treatment of, constitu of constitution is also very concise. Aristotle lists only four constitutions, democracy, oligarchy, aristocracy, and monarchy. The constitutions are distinguished according to the criterion for the allocation of magistracies, by lot in democracy, by census in oligarchy, and by education in aristocracy. Aristotle praises aristocracy by stating that in this regime, citizens are loyal to institutions because they are educated by laws and are, or to all intents and purposes, are stoic, the best. With regard to monarchy, it's defined as a rule of one man who is curious, sovereign in all things. Aristotle distinguishes here, as in the politics, two forms of monarchy, basileia, kingship, which is the correct form, and tyranny, the bad one, defined, defined as aoristos, without limits, because it's not subject to the law. Finally, Aristotle lists the ends of each constitution, freedom for democracy, wealth for oligarchy, education and the preservation of the institutions for aristocracy. And after a presumable lacuna regarding the end of the kingship, he mentions the end of tyranny, which is the protection of the tyrant with an armed guard, a commonplace in all writings on tyranny. In this treatment, there is no distinction between correct constitutions and deviations, paraguases, except in the case of kinship and tyranny. Now, 
Starting from these passages, it's impossible to clarify the relationship between rhetoric and political science, which Aristotle refers to with the metaphor of, of the offshoot. <laughs> I try <laughs> to <laughs> demonstrate this. We have to go back to the chapter 2 I quoted I, at the, the beginning, in which Aristotle defines rhetoric as an offshoot of both political science and dialectic, and examines also the relationship between rhetoric and dialectic that, that I left out earlier. Rhetoric and dialectic use the same argumentative tools, and above all, the antimem or rhetorical syllogism which corresponds to the dialectical syllogism. The two types of syllogism have the same type of premises, namely endoxa. In chapter one of book one of the topics, the treatise devoted to dialectical argumentation, Aristotle defines the endoxa. Uh, they are generally accepted opinions which commend themselves to all or, or to the majority or to the wise, uh, etc. These premises are also referred to in the rhetoric as common notions, takoina, suitable for use with the poloi, the multitude, that is, the ordinary citizens of the polis. But even politics uses endoxa premises. Political science, like ethics, is a practical, according to Aristotle, a practical science dealing with human actions. In chapter 3 of book 1 of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle discusses the method of practical sciences. The variability of human action, which are the subject matter of politics and ethics does not, does not allow for the construction of a rigorous science. He says, I quote, we must be pleased if in dealing with subject and starting from premises thus uncertain, we succeed in presenting a broad outline of the truth. In this passage, Aristotle mentioned is method of tu, tupo perilabein, that is, to describe in a rough, rough sketch. Thus, both practical sciences and rhetoric use endoxa premises, but in different way. This difference can be understood by means of a few examples that relate to the passages that have been quoted. The main subjects of the liberation dealt with in chapter 4 of book 1 of the rhetoric, that is revenue, revenue, war and peace, protection of territory, import and export legislation, are also discussed by Aristotle in book 7 of the politics, where he outlines his model of the Ariste Politeia, the best constitution. Aristotle describes city, that must have the resources to live self sufficiently, sufficiently, that is, with the necessary income to live well, albeit uh, soberly. He places the city close to the sea to provide it with harbors and a fleet in view of the import and export of goods. Considers it necessary to build fortification for defense, and most important of all, lays down a legislation to ensure order within the city and the attainment of virtue by all citizens. As we can see in Book 7 of Politics, the topics of political debate in the Assembly, <coughs> referred to in the rhetoric, are studied from the point of view of the political philosopher. Rhetorical discourse deals with 
a given situation in which a decision has to be taken, while the aim of politics uh, as a science is to analyze in depth the different forms of political organization and uh, to develop a political theory. To conclude, I would like to mention a problem that seems very difficult to solve. In the rhetoric, as we have seen, there are many references uh, to political science, while in the politics, Aristotle never mentions the role of the rhetorician. It, the rhetorician he describes in the rhetoric, that is, endowed with a wild, wide knowledge of political subjects. There is only one passage in which Aristotle refers to rhetoricians, but is about bad rhetorician, that is, demagogues. In fact, in chapter 4 or book 4 of the politics, Aristotle classifies the form of democracy and the worst of, worst of these is the so-called extreme democracy, the escate democratia, ruled by demagogues. Aristotle clearly refers to, to the radical democracy of the 5th century Athens, in which rhetoric takes over the role of politics and the decision of the assembly, prompted by demagogues, replace law. In this regard, therefore, for me, the real issue is as follows. Why did Aristotle write a treatise on rhetoric, which expound, as Kennedy writes, a theory of civic discourse, assigning the rhetoricians, rhetorician a political expertise, as we have seen, while in the politics, he gives to the rhetorician no role at all. I have no, <laughs> I have no resolution. resolution. But, uh, um, in this regard, is Aristotle rhetoric a handbook aiming at directing young disciples to political career, as some interpreters argue, or it's a, a treatise aiming to study from a logical and linguistic point of view the persuasive power of discourse. I defend this latter thesis. After all, Aristotle's rhetoric was never considered an handbook for teaching the art of discourse, precisely because its philosophical approach to to antimematic, so to speak. And uh, paradoxi paradoxically, uh, or significantly, the, uh, the appraisal of Aristotle's rhetoric in recent times is due to the same reasons that caused, caused its failure in the past, namely its logic and linguistic character. In this regard, the, uh, the best example is Perelman's treatise on argumentation, which openly refers to Aristotle's rhetoric. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gastaldi. We have now maybe five, ten minutes for the discussion. Uh, at the, at the end of at the, the end three, is with uh, you prefer it now or for me it's the same. You decide. For oh. If there is uh, questions, maybe ten minutes max uh, for these questions. Then please, uh, Professor Noll. Um, well, I just have a oh, sorry, I just have a suggestion how to maybe solve the puzzle, um, why he's not explicitly referring mm. in the politics to the rhetorics when he talks, for example, in book seven uh, of the politics, that kind of according to age, they need to have the phronesis in order to be part of the ruling class. I think maybe all the references to the phronesis are also 
or maybe uh, references to, to, to the rhetorics, because for deliberation you need the bouloitikon. Is that maybe mm. an answer? Or making my, am I making myself clear? Probably you are, uh, you are right, but uh, I, um, uh, I consider uh, uh, the, the role of uh, uh, um, uh, rhetorician in the com in uh, uh, politics as, as a wall. Uh, a wall. Uh, many times in, uh, uh, in politics, uh, Aristotle mentions nomocetes uh, kai politikos but never mentions uh, the rhetorician. Probably uh, in, a, a book, uh, in book seven, uh, in which Aristotle outlines his uh, uh, model of, of uh, best constitution, uh, he, uh, he, he thinks uh, of, the, a rhetori of a good rhetorician which, uh, who is uh, uh, interested in education uh, of, uh, young, uh, of young people. But this is an exception, uh, I, I think, because uh, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this regard, what uh, uh, you, uh, you said uh, is, uh, um, <coughs> Is uh, said also by uh, in by, in, uh, by uh, Reeve in a uh, um, paper in uh, the reading uh, edited by uh, Emily Rorty says on Aristotle uh, uh, Aristotle's uh, rhetoric. He says that uh, uh, rhetoric is uh, uh, useful in uh, some situation of, uh, 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 of political, political uh, situation. And he distinguishes, uh, in fact, between uh, bad and good, uh, <laughs> good constitutions. Uh, but <laughs> his point of view is <laughs> the opposite. Is <laughs> uh, opposite because he says that uh, in the best constitution there is no need of rhetorician at all because citizens uh, are already uh, phronimoi and uh, and uh, virtues. And uh, there is no need for uh, this, uh, for uh, uh, a, dis a discourse uh, persuading them to uh, attain virtue and so on. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a complex problem. I studied this topic uh, since uh, many, many years when I uh, um, started to study rhetoric, but it's, a, it's very... It's a problem. Probably you are right. I have to uh, to to read more uh, in depth uh, uh, book seven. Uh, and uh, thank you for <laughs> for your indication. Well, if there is uh, maybe I I will ask you a very short question. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, given given the the relevance uh, of uh, pathé and emotions in the rhetoric in Aristotle, mm -hmm. I wonder in this in this uh, rhetoric as offshot of uh, political science, uh, you didn't mention uh, emotions. Uh, could you say something about that? Are there? Uh, oh, uh, sure. Uh, uh. In uh, book one of rhetoric. Uh, um, Aristotle aims to, to found a new method for rhetoric based on three kinds of means of persuasion, uh, pistes and technoi, he says. There are, they are the uh, structure, the demonstrative structure of uh, 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 discourse of speech, the character of speaker, and third, the emotion that speaker can arouse in the uh, uh, in the citizens. Uh, um, the problem is, uh, and uh, the uh, and in fact, uh, in the book uh, two uh, uh, of the rhetoric, uh, in many chapters of the, the book two, he e examines in depth. Uh, uh, a gr large group of uh, of, uh, pace, of passions, and uh, uh, but 
uh, he gives a definition, uh, he, uh, he explains the situation in which a citizen can, uh, can uh, have such, uh, such type of uh, uh, reaction and so on. But uh, he says at the, uh, the same time that Speaker, speakers have to arouse this emotion through the speech. He criticized in book one, at the beginning of his treatise, the, the, the rhetorician that uh, have, uh, has only uh, aim of uh, uh, they handbook to arouse uh, these uh, uh, passions. The, pa uh, the passion can be aroused through the discourse. The discourse is have to be organized in a way in, wi in which emotion can be aroused. This is <laughs> what he says. Because he wants to uh, to dif uh, 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 he want uh, no uh, uh, that uh, um, his method is not no, 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 his <laughs> uh, uh, rhetoric is a technique and not simply a practice this uh, the common practice of rhetoric which, uh, in which uh, arousal of the emotion was uh, the current uh, pra practice. And uh, you know that uh, uh, in uh, the law courts, for example, uh, the um, uh, citizens uh, arrived uh, in a rough uh, habits with the children and, uh, and uh, so on. Uh, for Aristotle, um, passions have to arouse it through the, the, the structure of uh, discourse. It's difficult to, <laughs> to understand uh, why this uh, can happen, uh, uh, but uh, this is uh, what he, he, he says. But obviously, uh, <laughs> for uh, persuasion, the involvement of passion is uh, necessary. Uh, and Aristotle recognizes, uh, in effect, recognizes th this aspect. Thank you so much. We have a, a last, very short, maybe, question from Jakub. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can is, hear is you. Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I'm still wondering if, if these uh, quotations like that, uh, that the dial, uh, rhetorics is uh, off, offshoot of, uh, of, uh, of dialectics and politics, mm -hmm. and it's it dressing up as uh, as a rhetoric is disguised. Uh, sorry, as a politics, this disguised as a politics. If these uh, quotations are not uh, negative, as a criticism, if you take uh, that he is dressed up as something else, and this uh, and this off offshoot parafio parafio something which is against physics actually, or you can understand it. Para mm. is against. Oh. And uh, I shortly checked it, and they use it this parafio as a, for example for a case that. Do you have a six finger? Oh, I know. So, uh, is, isn't it? Uh, it could be an answer to to the quest to your question why it's not mentioned in in politics actually. But parafuse uh, uh, is a, a term uh, is, is an ambiguous term. It's at the same time positive and negative, as uh, um, Cope's commentary uh, uh, explains. Rhetoric and uh, uh, and uh, politics uh, grow from the same the same root, but uh, uh, Aristotle is very interested in separating the different uh, disciplines. Rhetoric is a technique; it's not a science. There is. Uh, Aristotle is very, very interested in 
uh, in uh, constructing uh, some different uh, um, uh, different uh, disciplines and uh, he um, found a new method for rhetoric. He is uh, very uh, is aware that uh, rhetoric is uh, traditionally involved in politics and at the same uh, uh, from his point of view rhetoric is involved in politics but at the same time is is separated from the uh, from the um, epistemological point of view thank you so much so In this case, in this case, uh, uh, para fues, um, I don't believe that para is to be supposed as something against or contrary or opposite, but something which is parallel, a eh? parallelism, parallelism, to say the same uh, preposition, of course, parallelism. but with no negative acceptions, because mm, this is a general statement in order to uh, clarify the distinction between, as you right uh, have, see, have said, between a technical skill or a scientific investigation. Thank you so much, uh, Silvia. Thank you so much. So, you want to say something? Sorry, Silvia. No, I, I just one uh, uh, the last uh, things. Uh, the last thing, um, the, the use of metaphors, paraphrase. And in the first line of uh, uh, rhetoric, rhetoric is, uh, uh, is the antistrophos to te dialectique. What antistrophos mean? <laughs> many, many <laughs> papers and books uh, yeah. have been written about uh, this, uh, this metaphor. No? It, it's, uh, it's curious because uh, Aristotle is, uh, uh, uses uh, metaphors uh, very, very seldom. But in this case, in case of rhetoric, <laughs> two metaphors are very, <laughs> very difficult <laughs> to, to understand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, uh, so we have now our, our next uh, speaker, Salvador Rus, uh, Rufino. Uh, it's a uh, it's a pleasure and honor to have you here. Um, professor Rus Rufino is full professor in uh, Universidad de Castilla León, uh, director of the Agencia para la Calidad del Sistema Universitario de Castilla y León, uh, also the director of uh, uh, Biblioteca de Historia del Pensamiento Político y Notorial Tecnos. Uh, he has uh, a, a lot of research done in uh, political science and also in ancient thought. And uh, he has edited also the politics of Aristotle. Uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure to have him here. And the floor is yours. Um, and I will retire. So <coughs> you have your thir 30 minutes. 30 minutes. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much. Well, I uh, thank you very much for, mm, to Collegium Politicum to this invitation, because now I am not uh, I am not every day in the university. I am not teaching at the university. I take care also to control the universities. Eh? And then I am part of the uh, dark side of the university system. And then I am Darth Vader <laughs> in the university in Castilla Leon. No? Well, um, I am out of the university science since uh, more or less 10 years ago. No? Well, I have no opportunity to to speech in, uh, in colloquium or in any places, no? Um, uh, I was, uh, I tried to speak in English. <laughs> it's not, my English is not very good. Eh? Uh, my English is like the Latin of the uh, German barbarian in the Limes. <laughs> it's very bad English, but well, excuse me, you know? um, My idea is to explain about oligarchy. Well, oligarchy is, a political uh, form of government. Eh? I would don't want to say constitution because constitution have another meaning in our 
uh, in our cultural uh, and juridical and political field. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a form of government, hmm? but it's, it's in the bad in the in the in the in the in the left or left or in the in the in the battle uh, place, no, is not the correct one, eh? and also is the corruption of aristocracy, no. But I am surprised because oligarchy is the real form of government. This is my idea, no. And the real form, because from my point of view. Eh, Monarchy is the, mo uh, the, uh, the monarchy is the government of one, but this one needs the support of a small group, and this group have the initiative, and this is the idea of oligarchy. A small group have all initiative. Their head is uh, very few people have the opportunity to. Determine the, uh, to uh, think the way of the whole society of, co of the whole <coughs> community, no? and this is the reason because I am surprised. I, I would like to talk about oligarchy. No, politic. Let me read the paper. No, politic uh, has a reference. It is carried out and developed looking at man or the human being. No. Instead, a state and form of government is configured where sovereignty, uh, sovereignty is located. History reveal to us that in all epoch, in all time, in all territory, oligarchy for have existed and sit still. Therefore, it can be said that human beings have preferred this form of social and political organization to other that have also happened in the history. The claim that oligarchy is only possible political form may seem somewhat exaggerated. The historical, social, and political reality show us that in a certain way, the oligarchy is the most frequent enduring regime that has undergone more transformation over the centuries. In this historical evolution, the oligarchy has shown us and chose a constant, the existence of a small group that has the initiative and has the control of power by familiar prestige, personal uh, patrimony or properties, number of employees in the enterprise or company, and accumulate properties, religious belief, uh, or performance of political position. This power is the in the oligarchies, manifests itself as a power that extends and is re retained politically as a power that allows a group to prevail over or act against other members of society. As a power that allows to control public opinion and the personal ideas of each citizen, or as the ability to generate situations and problems from which benefit and uh, take advantage uh, to obtain the domain of the group of some of them. Aristotle used several criteria to establish his classification of the constitutional form. Among others, the number of the rulers are indicated by the root of mono, uh, one, oligo, few. But it also uses the qualitative criterion that is con concretized in the end proposed by the government to serve or to use the regime, seek the common good or the particular good. In the middle between the regime of many, democracy of, of one monarchy, is the oligarchy, oligarchy, the rule of the few. If it is in the middle, we must at least grant that the possibility that it is not only be, uh, uh, possible, a possible regime, as historical realities have shown, but also that it is a regime that seeks a balance between two quantitative, quantitative and perhaps also qualitative extreme, between the regime of one and the regime of many. We will be in the question, in the, 
uh, we, uh, the question of the just mean that it is not obtained by the mathematical operation or a mechanical procedure, but require a complete and detailed knowledge of the circumstance. The right thing always is not an amount between zero and maximum possible level, but what is adequate and proportionate to the gravity of the situation always maintain the control of our action. In this case of political regime, the just middle ground in uh, in is re 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 relevated between the re extreme seeking what is adequate and proportionate to historical circumstances and the common good of citizens. The, p the power in oligarchy is concentrated in few families or individuals who are the richest, the people who have more property, more money, and so on. Therefore, power comes from among of wealth. It can be said that in the oligarchy, the ruler unity to power, they believe, uh, uh, they believe that they are in the position of the truth. This is the key of the situation. The people who have money have property. The people who make money, they think that they have the key of the success in their life. And this is the reason because they think that they are better than another one. Eh? The people who collected vote in the election, the people who uh, uh, are successful in the business, the people who are successful in the academic uh, way, no? they think, no, I am better than another one. And the key of the, uh, of, the, of the oligarchy is the successful of the people. And the support is that they believe that they are the best because they said, because they are successful in the life. This is the idea, eh? because uh, have no sense to say that the fundamental, the pillar of the oligarchy is the money, because this is plutocracy. The pillar of the oligarchy is the people who think that they are successful in the life, the people who have the key eh? of, the, of, the, of the, to be successful in the life. And this is the reason because they want to remain in the power. Because they want to control mm, the instrument, the means to, to be successful for him, to himself and to the family or his family. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason because Aristotle has a distinction of four kinds of oligarchy. And the last two one. Uh, are close to the uh, the distinction the, between the first the, the, the first and the second between uh, uh, third and the th and the four is that the oligarchy is uh, uh, make uh, establishes a mechanism to be, to uh, the succession of the people the power belongs to a people who are successful in the life and then they can they can give the power to his sons, brothers, or somebody. No? Another characteristic of the oligarchy is that they are a, in Spanish, is patrimonialization. Mm, transform the power in a private property. And the power belongs to me. This is maybe the, the, the logical of a, uh, a oligarchy. No? The power belong to us, <laughs> and we can use the power without any limitation. And the only the, the, uh, and the limitation is the law. And in the third and the fourth kind of oligarchy, they said they make law. Hmm? They are not under the law. They are not under the command of the law. They are over command of the law. And he said, Aristotle, well, this is very close to the tyranny. Very close to the tyranny. Because they have the power without limitation. This is the extreme of oligarchy. But another, the, the, the first and the second, they are not, they are under the command of the law. 
And this is the different. And the problem is that the oligarchy, the press, of the, the idea of the oligarchy is that people who have no limitation uh, using the power. And this is not true, really. This is one kind of the oligarchy. No? Um, Aristotle always said that this is one of the, the one of the mm, regimes in the, in, uh, because remember the biography of Aristotle. He was a uh, professor, he teach to the uh, uh, crown prince is uh, uh, Alexander, but Alexander was in Mieza with several uh, young people, several mm, uh, member of the aristocracy of Macedonia. This group, exactly this group, what the group with Alexander used to expand the empire, to uh, make the conquest of uh, the Persia. It's this group, and this group is a kind of oligarchy. And this is the reason because Aristotle said, okay, oligarchy is the regime, the regime, because also in democracy. Eh, in democracy, the people vote to the representative. Representation from the juridical point of view is a fiction. But in democracy, representation is a category. The seat in the parliament, the seat in the uh, city hall, the seat in the regional parliament belong to the man who got the representation. And this few person in the parliament, the council of the city hall in the, uh, another place, take all the seizure of the community without acts to the people, to the community. Today we were talking about koinonia. Koinonia is participation, but in democracy, in this, uh, uh, the, the participation is only go to, to vote, have the opportunity to vote. And I have no, any, in my city, I have no any participation in the politics. Nobody asks me about uh, what do you want? Do you want a new road in your house or do you want a new, no? And this is the reason because we are living, uh, and this is the reason also because Aristotle said that oligarchy is one uh, established regime, historical one, hmm? because the power belonged to few. The problem is this power belonged to few all time, then we have to say there are different kinds of the oligarchy. One is better, and another one is not, uh, is, is very bad. No? The problem is when the oligarchy transform a, a dynasty. Hmm? Remember when he said the, uh, this war is of uh, Polybius, but then as he closed it, the, the chain of the, of the political form, no? eh? monarchy mm, chain to aristocracy, no? and the aristocracy and degenerating the, the oligarchy. No? Why fr from monarchy to aristocracy? Because the people who held to the king are a aristocracy. And then when the king dis disappear, the king or the queen disappear, then you have a aristocracy. No? Remember what happened no? uh, in the history, no? usually. No? Well, then this is the reason because Aristotle affirmed that oligarchy arise when socially a series of values are accepted that allow to the establishing, develop. Okay? If the moderate, uh, if this value, uh, this regime is moderate, then we have a kind of oligarchy. If this um, regime is no moderate, okay? have all command had all power, have all means to control the power, eh? then this is a oligarchy, mm, uh, a bad, very bad oligarchy. No? This kind of oligarchy demands all property, all money, eh? all instruments to control the, uh, the b that life of, this, uh, of, the, of the community. No? Mm? And also have no limits, have no control. Mm? 
we can think that's what happened with politeia, no? It's a mixture between oligarchy and democracy. From my point of view, it's a wonderful idea, no? From Aristotle, because the few control to the many. And the problem usually in the, in the, in the politics is, in the book of politics, is try to find a control of the power. Try to find a mechanism to control the exercise of the power. Remember what happened in the first book of politics, opponent, excuse me, of uh, Republic, no? Of Plato, when um, Trasimaco acts about uh, the power, the command of the, of the stronger, no? Mm? And Plato has no, or Socrates has no a answer, no? And this is the question that uh, uh, Aristotle tried to develop also in the, in the politics, try to find a instrument, a control, to control the power, no? The oligarch, the man who is, uh, belong to an oligarchy, claims power of a personal patrimony because it is the power <coughs> is inseparably part of his social success and his personal role. It, became a, 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 it is a kind of natural right, excuse me to use this word that is not in the right, no? It's natural right and a class privilege. See, the power belong to me because I am successful. Because I, the oligarch presents himself as someone different, morally superior, with more experience and more qualifi qualification to exercise the power and to arrogate to himself the tax of governing, of the government of society. It is necessary to think about the, the uh, economics. Some people belong to the class of oligarchy when he can demonstrate that have money, that have a economic uh, solvency. Uh, if he lose his patrimony, if he have no enough money, uh, or his enterprise um, disappear, he 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 is not part of the oligarchy. He's not part of this club, no? Eh? And then he has to leave the power. Um, what happened in Greece? Well, Greece has a history, no, very complicated, no, like uh, Europe, like Spain, or like any territory in the life. But this is alternative. Uh, you have uh, some oligarchy, democracies, uh, kinship, uh, uh, monarchy, and so on. No? But the democracy arrives when the, when, when the community thinks that have enough power, enough reason to confront his ideas against the few people who command the society. When uh, the people have the possibility to change the government. Mm -hmm. When happened this one? Usually when there is a economics and technological uh, advantage. When the, remember the time of Solon of Athenas, uh, there is a, a transformation of the economies of, of Athens. No? Uh, uh, Athens began to, uh, to export to another um, uh, country, to another territory, the oil, uh, uh, is uh, the, the agriculture of uh, Athena passed from the cereals and, uh, to the uh, oil, no? And oil was the 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 best uh, the best business in the, in, the, in this time, no? And this time began the democracy. The people have money, the people have a possibility to participate in the public life, and then they change the 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 they can to change the the political uh, regime, no? The problem of uh, oligarchy, usually, when, is the, cha the, the, gener the chain of the regeneration, the succession of the oligarch. Because usually, the, <coughs> the oligarchy begins because some wealthy people 
uh, are agreed uh, and the problem is the continuity of the monarchy of the oligarchy mm. because the son the daughter of the of the oligarch uh, are not like this one have no enough money or have no too much money to uh, uh, to co to command or to uh, to control the, the society, no? In this, in this case, uh, the oligarchy becoming a democracy. In this case, there is a argument between oligarch and then the oligarchy disappear, no? Uh, and the, this is the, the, the last step of the oligarchy, eh? to disappear because they are not agreement between the people who are to, uh, who are part of the oligarchy no? well from my point of view what is oligarchy then in, in the in the idea of aristotle is a regime is historical that have the several phases several manifestation mm -hmm. but these several manifestation have two differences the first one is the a kind of oligarchy that is legal, legal, mm -hmm. that is under the command of the of the law, and another kind of uh, oligarchy that are not under the command of the law. The first one is the kind of oligarchy that uh, you can find in democracy with representation, mm -hmm. and the second one is the kind of oligarchy <coughs> that you can find in real oligarchy that a few people command all the uh, citizens, all the life of the society. No? Um, we can think that uh, oligarchy is, uh, everybody thinks that it's a bad regime, but in the history of commentary of Aristotle, uh, uh, of political Aristotle, there are different opinions. Mm -hmm. Some people think that it's a good regime, and some, another, some commentaries think that it's not a good regime, it's a bad regime, no? but mm, we can think that uh, this is uh, this is uh, uh, this is a decision of the commentators, no. But it's not a decision of the commentator. It's a decision of the commentator because they are living in a historical context, a very concrete time, uh, historical time, no. And then somebody thinks that, well, Aristotle, uh, uh, the, 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 the commentary uh, of uh, Aquinas is not, uh, is one of the first, no? That they are not agree with the, with the monarchy, uh, with the oligarchy, but uh, another commentary, no? Like, um, maybe, let me see here, no? John Case in, Ingl in, in England, no? they say in Esferas Civitatis, no? this is, uh, they say that it is, there is a m oligarchy mixta, eh? mm -hmm. there are a simple and ab a absoluta monarchy, uh, oligarchy, eh? and this is a distinction, and they say that they are uh, a good monarchy, or higher in, in University of Vienna, no? they they say there are there are two kinds of of, of, of uh, oligarchy, eh? um, some uh, uh, Jambo them he told about uh, oligarchy like there are different kinds and also they are not so bad and so on. No? But uh, or John Cal they say that imperium democraticum imperium oligarchicum and the difference is not the number is the is the is the the, the quantity of money that they have the government, eh? or Althusius, eh? he said that oligarchy is very bad, uh, like the um, low countries, uh, low country uh, government. No, but um, I think that there are no uh, agreement that oligarchy is a very bad regime. No? There are different kind of oligarchy, and some oligarchy are good, and another one is not uh, are uh, like tyranny, and then they. they decided to, to, to say that this is not a good regime, no? And this is, the, the, this is my, my idea, no? That we cannot say oligarchy is a bad regime, political regime, but we have two 
think about what is the meaning of the oligarchy. And the meaning of oligarchy is that a few have the initiative. Like we have uh, in our cities and we have in our countries eh, that a few people have all initiative. Eh? And it's, they have all initiative, but mm, sometimes if the initiative have under the command of the law, it is a good oligarchy. If uh, we have a, uh, is it not, uh, is out of the command of law, it's a very bad oligarchy. It's like a tyranny. No? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we open the floor for questions. Manuel? Manuel? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. That was interesting. Um, but doesn't Aristotle, when he offers his scheme of the six constitutions, say, well, oligarchy is clearly a bad regime because they don't care for the common good, right? So this kind of uh, what Trasumachos <laughs> says, it's in all constitutions or all political systems that the one that have the power, they care just for their own interest and they give the laws for their own interest. So even if there are laws, and Aristotle says, yeah, usually the laws are kind of correspond to the political system. So in the, even in the good oligarchies, according to your characterization, they would give laws for their proper interest. And, yes. and, and so that would be my main point. And then I think, you know, he, I think you had a good point when you said, yeah, the, the successful ones, uh, they are successful with money, they think they're the best. But obviously Aristotle would say, oh, yeah, they are what, very good in crematistique, <laughs> they are good money makers, but, but they are not really the best at all, because, you know, the best are the most just or the, the, the most um, virtuous and the most, the phronimos, et cetera, et cetera. So I think he, Aristotle, well, that could be a, a question. Do you think he's not recognizing the qualities of the rich enough? <laughs> yes. No, well, usually the problem, when I say that the successful, uh, is that the people who are successful in the life, uh, especially in this time in Greek, uh, that there are a big, a big mass of the people who are very poor, uh, the people who are successful, they think that they have the key of successful in the life. And they said, I am the best. You have to think this one, because if you are, uh, if somebody have nothing, and in 10 or five years, they are successful in the commerce, in the, in the um, uh, using, well, in the exportation of uh, oil or something like this. Uh, well, I think that he said, okay, I, I am the successful, the, the key of the successful. I am best than the, uh, these poor people, no? And this is, this is the psychological uh, main uh, idea of uh, oligarchy. No? Also, I can see every day in the life with the people who are, excuse me to put this example, no? is the people who are president of the university. I, from my position, I have contact every day almost every hour with people who are rector, president of the university. They believe that they are better. Because they won a election. I have contact with the politics, the politics, the people who are in the politics, the presidents and so on. They felt, they, they, they are convinced that they are better. And this is, the, this is in Latin there is a, a verb, uh, 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 usually I said that the power, the people who have the power have to ministrare, serve. No ministrare, to be served. But the, the problem is when you change the ministrare for ministrare. For ministrare. And this is very usual. Hmm? You think about the politician, our politician. They told in the first, uh, I, 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 usually. Mm -hmm. People who are in the top of the enterprise, they never just, we 
God. No, I got my plan is the best one. This is the problem of oligarchy. And also, I think that we have to think about the representation. Because the representation, from my point of view, is the tricky of the democracy. And also, is the cr crisis of the democracy. Because representation is nothing. Okay. I am sure that you have an account in a bank. Do you have a, any participation of the political economy of the bank? Nothing. You have to, and also, if, if you want, when you want to close your account, the bank says, no, please, remain with us, please, <laughs> something like this. No. You have any, also in your city. Next m Sunday, we have to vote our representative in the, in the city hall. We have no, we have opportunity one time every four years to say yes or not. And then forget it. This is the problem of the. Uh, this is a kind of oligarchy. Really, oligarchy un under the command of law. But sometimes, no. How many democracy began itinerary in the 20th century? Uh, leadership that arrived to the power using the legal, legal system and then use the legal system to, 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 no, to, transform, to remain to re all time in the power. To remain, so. mm. Then this is, the, this is the question usually, no? How many times you see in the newspaper that uh, this bank make the election of the new president? No, the president is forever. <laughs> This is a kind of oligarchy. And this is the reason because Aristotle made false difference of the oligarchy. Hmm? This is my point of view. Well, this is a point of view from the political <laughs> science view. No? Hmm? So, one, two more questions. Uh, Professor Gastaldi, Gastal Thank you very much for your, uh, pre uh, for your presentation. Um, in my opinion, uh, in uh, <coughs> politics, uh, uh, oligarchy is uh, always uh, presented by Aristotle uh, as a very bad regime. Not really. Uh, he lists uh, a series of different kinds of o oligarchy, no? uh, uh, and the worst of, uh, uh, of them is uh, dynasteia. Uh, in, uh, uh, as in which uh, uh, power is uh, hereditary. Mm, in, uh, in the politics, uh, mm, for uh, these reasons, Aristotle uh, suggests some uh, uh, devices to uh, uh, um, aiming at uh, uh, mm, producing some uh, forms all oligarchy more more moderate oligar uh, oligarchies is uh, mm, the same <laughs> the same system no uh, as uh, for uh, democracy uh, so for uh, uh, oligarchy he lists a, a series of uh, um, devices uh, to uh, moderate the violent character which uh, uh, of the oligarchy because uh, the violence of uh, oligarchs is, uh, 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 is a, 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 a motive, uh, is a, a, a causes of, uh, um, of damage for the city. Uh, Aristotle, I think, uh, is, uh, uh, w uh, thinks uh, always about uh, the uh, Athenian experiences of oligarchy. The uh, two experiences uh, for uh, who uh, that uh, lasted very uh, uh, s some uh, uh, only some months because democracy was uh, uh, stronger than uh, uh, oligarchy and the oligarchy, as uh, uh, for example in. Uh, uh, 404 uh, ruled by Critias uh, is uh, a, a typical example of uh, uh, violent uh, uh, oligarchy. 
we and uh, uh, the uh, return of Trasibulus uh, and the restoration of democracy demonstrate that in Athens uh, oligarchy was uh, not a, a regime, uh, a positive regime, and uh, I think that uh, Aristotle does, uh, is not a supporter of a, a radical democracy, of course, but neither uh, a supporter of oligarchy. In book four, uh, he uh, <coughs> studies the different form of a mixed constitutions. Uh, uh, probably uh, uh, Politeia, that is a, a perspective a solution, uh, is a, a solution, the best solution for, uh, for Aristotle. Uh, so, no, <laughs> no, no radical uh, democracy, no neither radical. Uh, oligarchy. <laughs> oligarchy, because uh, oligarchy uh, quickly slows, uh, as uh, Manuel said, mm. uh, as, uh, are, are, are prompted only for the interests of a small group of rich people. <laughs> Well, th thank you very much. Well, let me, if some regime um, use the violence, it's out of the law. Law and violence is not compatible. And the law uh, try to prevent the use of the force. And this is, yes, yes, believe me, this is the, when I study law in my, <laughs> in, my in, in Sevilla, we say that the law is the instrument to try to avoid the violence to try to avoid the command of the force. Eh? And this is, well, usually this is the idea. But I say that there are four kinds of oligarchy. The radical oligarchy is tyranny. And the moderate oligarchy can to be part of a mixed constitution. Because <coughs> they can use, the problem with the, re the, the simple regime monarchy, democracy, oligarchy, aristocracy, tyranny, uh, and so on, the simple re regime have always a end. You, uh, this is the idea also that uh, of Polybius, and, and this is the reason because <laughs> Aristotle have to look for a established re regime that is a mixture of two bad regime, democracy and, uh, and oligarchy. As you said, no radical uh, democracy, no radical oligarchy. And, and what is the reason? Because the few, the, 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 the many people, the democracy, make control of the, of the use of the power of the few. And this is the bridge between democracy and oligarchy is the, the representation. This is the bridge. And we have to study the bridge to understand eh, the, why he decided to uh, take the decision, took the decision that two bad regimes can make a good regime, a more established one. And it's true because this is the fundamental of our democracy. Uh, the representative, the command of the executive and also the command of the, of the parliament and also the people who vote the parliament. This is the, this is the idea. And also, but the radical oligarchy that used the violence okay, is a law regime, and this is a regime that is out of the law, and this is a tyranny. Hmm? So I think we have one last question here in the first. Well, I understand that your contemporary reading of Aristotle <coughs> politics uh, this far on, on oligarchy. Uh, because, well, uh, nowadays, if uh, we live in democracies, but most of them are, are oligarchies, you are right in that. <laughs> I also understand that there was a, a revaluation of oligarchy along history, perhaps in 19th century, but they call that, uh, mm -hmm. not using the word uh, uh, oligarchy. But in my opinion also, not only Aristotle, but also the, the commentators on, on oligarchy until what I see, I'm more, I learn more on 16th century, what I read, for, for, for example, in Machiavelli, when he's referring to the oligarchic model and so on, it is always a critic, not only because the, the oligarchs, they follow their own good, but also because it's, it's not a, a stable uh, regime. These oligarchs, they are frequently fighting each other, 
and oligarchy is also a cause, a frequent cause of civil war. Mm. Sometimes a never ending uh, mm -hmm. uh, civil war because the parties, they are almost equal in, in power. Mm -hmm. And also, for example, in 16th century France, thought, uh, Seychelles, uh, also the Calvinists later, Gentilly, Duplessis Mornay, when they, they evaluate the Italian cities, they criticize these cities because they are oligarchy ones and frequent, and there is a frequent civil war. So for them, the, the oligarchy is one of the less stable and, uh, and, and more conflicting uh, uh, regimes close to the anarchy, that for all of them, they follow in that, the Aristotelian, the Aristotelian tradition. Anarchy is the, the worst thing that can happen in, in politics. Well, thank you. No, this is, the anarchy is the oclocracia, <laughs> oclocracy, no? Uh, um, no, the anarchy is oclocracy uh, in, uh, in ten of Polybius, no? But I think that we have to read the commentator of politics, not the politics that are uh, inspired in Aristotle, not the commentator, the real commentators, no? that they follow line by line. Eh, the, uh, and, um, when Machiavelli, no, or another one, why mm, usually Machiavelli have the, in, the, in his mind, uh, mm, a king like Ferdinand the Catholic? Because he, is, he have the command he, uh, he, he said, okay, I, uh, he make a, a small kingdom like Aragon, a big one universal monarchy, no? Bec uh, because he have a group of people who help him. Uh, he changed uh, the representative of the monarchy he, uh, in the, uh, previous to him, the representative called general, uh, uh, Capitan, General Captain, no? and now he said, be eh? the people who act in the name of the, re of the, of the king. No? And this is a different, no? and, um, and he said, okay, well, uh, Ferdinand the Catholic make a monarchy almost like a good oligarchy, eh? supported by good collaborators eh? that can help him to build up a universal monarchy. And the contrast is the king of, of, of France, that he tried to uh, use the army to conquest Naples and, and so on, and he, and he are not successful. No? The problem is the, the, the idea of Machiavel as uh, um, Ferdinand Catholic is that he is a king successful. This is the idea. And the battle oligarchy is. Uh, you said uh, what we call the time of Robespierre, the time of terror, the violence. That is, this is a kind of tyranny. No? Uh, and I think that this is the, the idea. No? And then the, we have to read carefully the, the commentator and, to, and also the commentator in the historical context. Because the commentator during the war of the 30 years is different than the commentator in the medieval time and also commentator after the war of 30 years. Hmm. Uh, and, and I think that they, they are, um, they, there is a, a strong influence of the time, of the historical time, no? to consider their political regime. No? Hmm. So thank you very much. Uh, I think, yep. <laughs> We have uh, our last speaker before lunch, correct? Um, I welcome to the table Kazutaka Inamura from University of Waseda in Tokyo, Japan. So a, a book good proof of the international dimension of this uh, conference. Uh, he, he has a PhD in the University of Cambridge uh, and also he has dealt with uh, political philosophy and history of political thought and uh, published Justice and Reciprocity in Aristotle Political Philosophy, 2015, in Cambridge. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah. Very much appreciated. And thank you for having me today. Yeah. <coughs> I'm very happy to you speak here. Uh, it's very honor for me. <coughs> so I'm just
So uh, today I want to speak about okay, Aristotle's non idea of political theory in politics for book four to uh, book six. And part of my argument today already appears in Police uh, Journal uh, 2022. Uh, it's open access, so free download. Uh, uh, please, maybe if you got interested uh, today. So, but uh, first, just uh, before moving on to today's topic, I want to talk a little bit about the entire uh, framework of my current project, uh, which will be hopefully published uh, as a, my second book in English. So, uh, so my current project now well, examines how Aristotle uses uh, craft analogies to develop his concept of virtue, practical wisdom, phronesis, and political science. And, well, usually, you know, in the scholarly literature, it's well known that Aristotle distinguishes between phronesis and techne, you know, craft. And that view uh, plays a very important role in the history of political thought, just because, you know, in politics, it's, it's a different matter from, you know, technology or uh, skill. So, you know, uh, politics or, you know, uh, political activity has an intrinsic value. That view, you know, uh, helps to develop the view idea that, you know, politics has a kind of intrinsic values uh, different from instrumental, you know, activities. So that kind of, you know, uh, political philosophy is very famous uh, in the scholarly literature. But now, you know, I want to draw different, you know, draw, uh, I want to focus on a different, you know, aspects, features of Aristotle's politics. And, well, <coughs> In Plato, Socrates, it's well known, you know, uh, Socrates uh, uses craft analogy to, you know, develop the notion of justice, virtues, etc. Uh, but it is relatively underexplored in Aristotle how, you know, he uses uh, craft analogy to develop these concepts. So I want to, you know, uh, draw uh, atten your attention to this dimension in Aristotle. But, uh, well, by art, you know, by techne, he means uh, both uh, very various, you know, features, various connotations. So he, for, for example, he means a body of universal knowledge about a, a kind of particular subject matter, and he also sometimes means a causal explanations. Uh, but uh, in a different context, he means a skill of dealing well with particular situations, etc. So, you know, he he has a diverse, di you know, draw attention to di diverse dimensions uh, of art, and so. <coughs> In that respect, you know, giving one working definition is not sufficient for understanding uh, his concepts of art. So I want to, you know, uh, uh, examine a wide variety of uh, his connotations of art uh, to to illustrate different perspectives his political uh, his politics or political art. <coughs> well, so uh, these uh, contexts I have already uh, manuscripts, but uh, hopefully, you know. In the future, in the several, in the coming uh, few years, uh, I I can finish <laughs> this project. But at any rate, you know, uh, for example, <coughs> I want to address a kind of you know how he uses craft, the notion of craft to develop his conception of virtue or uh, uh, practical wisdom, etc. And uh, so, but uh, today I want to focus on uh, this chapter, a part of this chapter, <laughs> uh, how he uses craft analogy to develop his non ID political theory. So that's uh, today's topic. <clears throat> of course, you know, that's also a key, you know, uh, concept of art is key to, he, to understand his theology as well. <clears throat> but uh, just, just for <coughs> focus on uh, chapter five. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so the issue or uh, uh, kind of one problem, problem with the composition of politics is a kind of discrepancy between his ideal vision in books uh, three, seven, and eight on the one hand, and his uh, kind of empirical non-ideal uh, theory in books uh, four to six on the other hand. So the issue in the scholarly liter literature is how to integrate Aristotle's empirical analysis of various constitutions in book uh, four to six into his general framework of political philosophy. And scholars, uh, just you know, uh, citing uh, Bernard Yeager, he argues that uh, well, well, Aristotle felt a certain difficulty in combining Plato's utopian speculations with this uh, purely empirical treatment. <clears throat> so no, 
no solution <laughs> Jaeger's framework. Just you know, uh, kind of uh, developmental approach. His developmental approach, you know, help uh, us to understand this project. But I doubt that a little bit. And uh, more recently, uh, Richard Claude maintains that Aristotle's realistic study of, of correct craft regimes had nothing to do with uh, the rest of Aristotle's political philosophy. So he also, you know, uh, has no solution <laughs> about this discrepancy. And Jacob, uh, today in the morning, uh, you offered a kind of, you know, uh, a difference in audience. <laughs> uh, maybe that may be uh, uh, one explanation. But uh, well, I want to argue uh, Aristotle's concept of art is key to understanding the constitution of absolute ideas, appropriate constitution of real situation under given conditions, and even uh, deviate constitution, including tyranny. So his argument of tyranny is also a kind of you know, a matter of consequences of that. Uh, his conception of art, you know, uh, suggests that he must address, you know, uh, uh, non-ideal situations, even uh, tyrannical governments. He, you know, art must offer, art by art, you know, uh, he must offer uh, any, you know, suggestions about, uh, e even about deviant constitutions. <coughs> so that's uh, uh, my thesis today. So, well, this is a famous passage uh, uh, from the beginning of Poetics 4. So uh, Aristotle outlines, uh, write, write, writes out, write for his political science research, and draw, drawing a kind of analogy <coughs> between uh, art and political science. So it's a, sorry, a long quotation, but uh, let me just uh, read out. So he says, you know, all among all the arts and sciences that are not partly developed, but that having become complete, uh, deal with some one kind. So you know, art must, you know have some one subject matter uh, for you know in line with Socrates argument so at any rate you know uh, art uh, address uh, uh, any phenomena in the subject in subject matter uh, it belongs uh, to singles want to get the theoretical grasp on what is fitting in the case of each kind so for example in gymnastics uh, what sort of uh, physical training is beneficial for what sort of body and what sort is best uh, for the best, it's necessarily fitting for the most uh, sort of body that is uh, by nature most noble and most nobly equipped. And uh, what's one sort of training is fitting for most bodies, uh, for this is uh, also a function of training. And further, uh, if someone has appetite neither for a physical state nor for scientific knowledge appropriate for those involved in competition, a kind of for professional athletes, so it, belong, it belongs no less to coaches and athletic trainer to provide this a kind of inferior capacity too for common people. And uh, we see something similar occurring with regard to medicine, shipbuilding, clothes manufacture, etc. And uh, it is clear it belongs to the same science to get a serious grasp on uh, now, you know, uh, about a uh, task in political science he, he's going to mention. <coughs> and uh, these sentence numbers are, are kind of, you know, uh, my uh, additions. Uh, to clarify, you know, uh, it uh, those uh, corre those correspond to uh, task in political science in the next slide. <coughs> so now, just you know, well, uh, now uh, we have four uh, features of uh, tasks four tasks in political science. So uh, first, you know, first is uh, is concerned about ideal, you know, ideal ideal constitutions. So n now, you know, we must explore what's the best constitution institution is, and that, you know, no external uh, impediment stand in its way. And, well, Aristotle in book four uh, said, uh, we have discussed aristocracy and kinship, and for studying the best constitution is the same as discussing these names. So he suggests that, uh, well, maybe he had already written uh, book three, and uh, maybe or book uh, seven and eight, and he already explored, you know, what the best constitution is in these books. So he don't he doesn't uh, need to you know address this question in in his empirical books. So he leaves uh, this task first uh, the first task uh, you know outside in empirical books. And well now the second, so that's uh, a very you know relative to uh, uh, power uh, dynamics in the constitutions. <coughs> so he you know needs that he wants to explore what constitution is fitting for what state, and well. <laughs> Just uh, Aristotle works on this task in uh, Politics 4.12. Uh, 
but uh, he doesn't de doesn't uh, tell details, and he just you know suggests uh, the part of a state that wishes the constitution to endure must be stronger than the part that <laughs> that doesn't. So just you know, uh, it's relative to power dynamics. So uh, well. Uh, if you know rich people uh, have a stronger power in that constitution, uh, we must establish uh, oligarchy, you know, in that constitution, <laughs> in that uh, police. Whereas the, you know the power dynamics, you know, uh, leads towards uh, uh, demos, uh, uh, pop popular, uh, uh, common people. So in that case, you know, he, uh, uh, we must establish a democracy. So just you know, it's relative to power dynamics uh, in this you know framework. <coughs> And the third is a bit uh, more uh, uh, main focus I want to draw. So uh, in the third questions, you know, uh, we must explore what constitution is fitting, given certain assumption, and uh, where he says it must be able to study how any given constitution ma ma might come into existence from the start, and in what way uh, once it exists, it might be preserved for the long, longest time. <laughs> just just uh, leave it uh, for now uh, to address uh, uh, to uh, explore in detail the third one. And uh, just, you know, uh, fourth, uh, uh, fourth issue is what constitution is most fitting for all states. Uh, so and he suggests the middle constitution uh, is the best uh, for most states by drawing an LGBT constitution and the individual life. So just, uh, you know, um, a polity, you know, a politeia uh, in a narrow sense. Uh, uh, is the kind of best constitution for most of the states, but it's a little bit uh, different from idealized, uh, you know, uh, aristocratic constitutions. <clears throat> so that's a basic, you know, framework of uh, uh, entire empirical, you know, empirical books of Aristotle's text. <clears throat> and just you know, uh, the, uh, these are just one example uh, from. Uh, the conceptions of art and virtue, and uh, where well, I quote uh, a passage from uh, Nicomachean Ethics, but at any rate, you know, he considers that virtue, as well as any art, must address non-ideal situations uh, if he has a really a good skill. And so, well, he said, well, for example, you know, a truly good, uh, prudent, prudent, uh, prudent person uh, will bear strokes of fortune suitably, even though uh, he uh, faces unfortunate situations. You know, uh, from his resources, uh, you know, uh, he he will do the finest actions. Just as you know, uh, these are just a, a craft analogy. <clears throat> so, well, just you know, taking exam uh, some examples. You know, a good builder can construct finest house from plenty of excellent resources. So that's a kind of idealized situations. But even if you know he has uh, just a lim limited resources, he can you know construct a comfortable house. And uh, just taking another example, maybe good cook is not a good example for ancient Greeks because you know good good uh, cook uh, was not respected <laughs> in ancient Greece. Just, you know Socrates says in Plato's Gorgias, you know cook was just a matter of experience; it's not a matter of art. But just you know, well, uh, <laughs> following uh, common. Uh, present day understanding of a cook. You know, good cook can make the best food using best green ingredients and cook something with left, <laughs> left over uh, with his uh, refrigerator. But at any rate, you know, it is not that <laughs> the best cook can cook the best French dish only and provided with high quality ingredients. So just, you know, uh, a trivial example suggests that, you know, we must address, you know, non-ideal situations if he, you know, we have a good skill about uh, 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 cooking. So that's a kind of view of good civilization of arts, genuine arts. So, uh, you know, just uh, following analogy, you know, good people can cope with any situations they face. So, well, uh, so, uh, you know, many texts uh, suggest, you know, uh, uh, if you have a skill of virtues, you can address, you know, uh, you can have a good control of, of external situations, and so uh, you know, uh, not only you know, uh, virtuous people can address ideal situation, but rather uh, they must also you know offer uh, good advices about you know uh, non-ideal, difficult situations. So that's a view of uh, you know uh, art in <laughs> Aristotle, especially uh, Aristotle as well as Plato. <clears throat> So using this, you know, uh, conception of arts, Aristotle, you know, 
develops his non ideal political theory. And maybe just, you know, uh, the third task, uh, you know, uh, just back to, sorry, back to slide, uh, well, uh, he uh, said, you know, uh, the third issue is what constitution is a good, uh, give advantages, give a certain assumption. And this, has, this term is a little bit, you know, uh, hard to uh, understand, but uh, well, now uh, I'll explain <coughs> Well, this is different from, uh, well, assumption is not just, you know, a social or natural circumstances, but rather just its uh, value uh, citizens promote in the constitutions. <coughs> More a little bit, you know. Uh, well, so, you know, not ideal, you know, social circumstances, but rather, you know, uh, we must uh, respect values that citizens promote in the constitution. So political scientists must offer good advices uh, to, you know, uh, satisfy the values citizens promote in the constitution. So that's a view. And that uh, value is not uh, what Aristotle uh, uh, himself uh, fully, fully, you know, is fully committed or just, you know, Aristotle doesn't respect, you know, uh, the assumptions they hold, but uh, well, at any rate, he, uh, you know, as a political science, must uh, uh, offer advices to satisfy that, uh, you know, value. So, for example, just uh, pieces of evidence for uh, uh, this view of assumption. So, for example, he says uh, those who are establishing a constitution seek to combine all the features that properly, properly belong to its assumption. But, uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, this is not a good idea, according to Aristotle, because, you know, uh, for example, the assumption of a democratic constitution is freedom, but if, uh, you know, people seek, Democrats seek, you know, uh, uh, this assumption to an extreme extent, you know, they will, you know, uh, uh, create a more tyrannical, you know, uh, democracy without rule of law. So, well, assumption is not, you know, uh, uh, it's not good uh, to, for preservation of the, the Constitution, but rather, you know, according to Aristotle, we, we must seek the middle ground, and, you know, more moderate version is much more, you know, <laughs> surviving. But uh, at any rate, so he doesn't want to say, you know, assumption is a kind of principle or essential feature to uh, make democracy sustainable, just because, you know, if we seek assum it, the assumption of freedom, uh, they will destroy democracy. But at any rate, you know, assumption is a value they, uh, they want to, you know, uh, promote in democratic constitution, or in any constitution, in the constitution. So another piece of evidence where <laughs> Aristotle says uh, about uh, relative to assumption, he, he explains the meaning of relative assumption because uh, it often happens that while one constitution is more choice worthy, nothing prevents a distinct, different one from being more uh, advantageous for some. So uh, it's uh, again, you know, assum relative to assumption is uh, a little, even though they have more choice worthy, they can, you know, establish more choice worthy uh, aristocratic government, uh, they, they seek, you know, different one uh, according to uh, this, uh, this terminological framework. <coughs> And he, uh, another piece of evidence, so he writes in book two, uh, where one might also criticize the assumption of the legislator just as Plato criticized it in the laws, uh, for the entire order characteristic of their laws aim at a part of virtue, namely military virtue, since this is useful for conquest. So the assumption of Spartan you know, constitution is kind of military virtue they promote. But uh, again, you know, Aristotle criticizes uh, this assumption uh, just because that's not so uh, good for uh, for their survive uh, for uh, sustaining their constitution. But at any rate, uh, the con you know these uh, uses of uh, frame uh, terminology assumption suggests that assumption is a kind of you know value citizen promote in the constitution. And so uh, type three, a uh, task three, uh, you know, <laughs> aims to offer practical means to achieve the purpose of constitution that its citizen assume to be good. So, uh, you know, Aristotle himself doesn't support that. <laughs> well, so, you know, this, you know, framework uh, uh, is useful uh, for understanding his arguments uh, about tyranny in book uh, five, chapter 11. And uh, of course, you know, he was not uh, eager to discuss tyranny itself, and uh, he recognizes tyrannical method is full of vice. So it's a little bit controversial how, why, you know, why he, you know, argues 
about the method for preserving uh, tyranny. And so uh, many scholars said, for example, uh, Keith, it's just an infamous handbook for tyrants. And Miller said, it's controversial treatment of tyranny is presents the most serious challenge for us. And uh, he answers that even uh, you know this argument is part of Aristotle's concern for justice, because it offers a way for Thailand to become virtuous like a king, uh, or at least half virtuous. So you know uh, Mira treats this argument as a part of a uh, notion of justice, and quote you know uh, just you know uh, says Aristotle compares his content for those who submit uh, uh, Thailand's way. Uh, they, these are kind of you know, uh, their views uh, about uh, the treatment, why, why Aristotle offers argument about preserving tyranny. But uh, just I want to you know, uh, say, I want to claim that uh, well, uh, this argument is also an embodiment of Aristotle arts and sciences that deal with non idea situations and achieve some good. <clears throat> well, so, <clears throat> uh, well, just you know, uh, uh, as you might know well, uh, this argument, uh, Aristotle, uh, you know, in this in this part, uh, explore two methods of maintaining tyranny, and the traditional way, uh, the first one is traditional way of repression, and the second way is kingly way of moderation, and the former is just summarized into three types. So you know, the rule uh, must think, uh, must must be forced to think small, and they must uh, you know distrust each other and result in having no power. So those are methods for uh, you know. Uh, a kind of traditional methods for you know preserving tyranny, and the latter, uh, kingly manner, suggests that tyrants should like uh, a king. So, for example, you know tyrants should appear to be uh, take appropriate care for public funds, and Arist But uh, you know, but Aristotle makes a reservation that tyrant must keep holding tyrannical power over unwitting subjects because this is necessary requirement for to be a tyrant, and so tyrant must treat this as a, as an assumption. So again, you know. Aristotle, you know, uh, uh, treats, uh, respects, uh, in some sense, uh, you know, uh, uh, tyrannical, tyrannical government as a kind of assumption, and he tried to, you know, offers advices uh, to satisfy the, you know, assumption of tyrant. And uh, why? Well, just because, you know, his conception of art uh, suggests that even if political science don't embrace the assumption of constitution, they should be able to offer arguments to achieve preserve the constitution. So uh, in that respect, you know, his notorious argument about preserving ty tyranny is also part of you know, this scientific spirit. So uh, maybe just let me finish. <laughs> well, uh, maybe I, I'll skip this over. Uh, at any rate, you know, present day political theory also you know, develops uh, a non-ideal theory deriving from John Rawls. Uh, but uh, John Rawls doesn't have task three uh, uh, in his framework. And well, uh, you know, John, uh, John Rawls theory also, you know, develops uh, kind of you know, uh, ideal theory as well. But uh, well, he also deals with uh, obstacle to the establishment of I no ide ideal society because of some citizens non compliance with the principle of justice, and they may face unfavorable social uh, economic conditions. And so, non ideal theory has issues of punishment, just so, etc. <laughs> And so in this framework, at any rate, you know, ideal theory helps clarify the goal of reform with which the queries of non-ideal theory can be answered. So at any rate, you know, non-ideal theory must be, you know, answered in line with the ideal theory, theoretical framework. But Aristotle political theory also, you know, has a similar feature as well. <coughs> so this is just a summary of my uh, presentation today. So Aristotle's political science also includes, uh, you know, ideal theory uh, <coughs> specified in task, uh, task one. So it assumes no external obstacle, obstacle, obstacles. Uh, but uh, of course, you know, ideal theory. Sorry, it's a typo. So ab uh, absolute theory, uh, non-ideal theory assume can assume enormous cost, and uh, maybe you know they also, you know, ideal theory may also require that almost every citizen should be good, respect justice in the best constitution. And uh, well, of course, you know, Aristotle's theory uh, includes non-ideal uh, one. So uh, you know, uh, these may maybe we can say you know these components uh, are, mess, are relatively similar to uh, present-day political theory. But uh, task three is a kind of additional element that is not included <coughs> in the present one. Well, and uh, well, just because you know, uh, Aristotle requires political science to offer useful insight on preserving the ex existing constitutions, 
whose idea they don't embrace. So uh, they take the current system seriously, not necessarily because they want to change the constitution to idea one, but, uh, but uh, because you know, they help people achieve what they people assume to be good. So uh, while well, Aristotle's political art requires such consider consideration, because uh, his conception of art requires craftsman scientists to be capable of co coping with any situations. So uh, maybe just you know, <laughs> that. Uh, uh, I, uh, so I, I hope I have explained why you know Aristotle develops uh, his own idea theory, including you know his argument about how to preserve tyranny, even you know tyranny or well, no you know deviant constitutions. Thank, thank you. So maybe a little bit more. Hard. So thank you very much for your talk. So we have, you have, we have now a good 10 minutes. Veronica, please. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk and uh, for elucidating this uh, parallel between uh, techne and political, oh, thank you, political science. Uh, 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 well, uh, we can notice that uh, when Aristotle speaks about the analogy uh, uh, between art and uh, conduct. Uh, he also speaks about certain limitations, so it means he quits uh, this analogy at certain point, especially uh, when he recognizes that uh, when we talk about arts, uh, we appreciate the outcome, and that's enough. And we don't care about the character of the person who is uh, producing this, uh, this, this product. Mm. Uh, but this is not the case of the uh, ethical conduct. So my question is if this limitation or kind of such limitation applies also to um, uh, the analogy you were uh, talking about, the analogy between art and uh, political mm. science. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. So I think you, may, uh, you refers to Nico Machian ethic book to a distinction between virtue and uh, art or a skill. Yeah, that, that's a very famous text. <laughs> but uh, well, so but that notion of art is a little bit limited. Uh, well, focus on the na narrow perspective of art. But uh, in another text, he also says, well, uh, you know, craftsmen have some dispositions to create good pro products in most cases, and so you know, uh, well. In some sense, you know, uh, art, artists also sa have some, you know, even though they have, they don't have character, they have some, you know, uh, stable disposition to create uh, 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 relatively good products uh, in most cases. So, well, maybe that notion of art is much more, you know, uh, uh, well, I, I, I suppose, you know, those notions of art, uh, you know, art appear in. Uh, appear in many texts in Aristotle, and so well. So well, so maybe you know. I, I suggest you know. Uh, you you are you are uh, that that view you mentioned is maybe not so helpful to understand other texts in Aristotle, especially in politics, etc. So maybe that one response. Uh, sorry. Uh, maybe not sufficient for so yeah so maybe that that's one suggestion. We had one more question from Beatriz Posse. Thank you very much for your paper, and I wonder if you could uh, explore a bit more this conception of the tyrant that can become virtuous or have virtues, as you said, if you. Uh, compare that with uh, Plato's view or with uh, Aristotle's view that there are some people who are incurable and cannot change and cannot be saved at all. Thank mm. you. Uh, so, sorry, so, so que your question is? <laughs> I wonder virtues or half virtues because I find it it is not consistent with mm -hmm. Aristotle's view that some people are incurable and cannot be changed after you know a period of time all the, the vice 
vicious dispositions become steady and they, uh, it cannot be changed. So I wonder if you could say anything about uh, that. Okay. Yeah, maybe inconsistency <laughs> in his view. So just, you know, maybe this suggestion can apply to only some, you know, moderate Thailand's, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, it may be, this uh, suggestion is not so useful for those who, you know, those who, who can't be, you know, modified, you know. Uh, so uh, maybe it's a little bit, maybe optimistic. Th this suggestion may be very optimistic. Uh, well, so the more traditional manner of, you know, repression uh, <laughs> Uh, can be useful for those for those you know very bad tyrants, but uh, then you're right. <laughs> well, so Aristotle is a little bit you know always dependent on the situation uh, he he faces, and so uh, not so you know <laughs> a reformist <laughs> to 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 change uh, the tyrant. So well, uh, just you know he offers uh, any alternatives uh, 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 people want to use. So it's a kind of spirit of again science. So we have uh, three more questions, starting from Manuel. Yeah, maybe Knoll. a follow up to, to your question. <laughs> if, the if Plato is, if Plato is right and, and and the tyrant is kind of possessed by eros, mm -hmm. uh, then kind of it's not very realistic. Mm -hmm. When when Aristotle says you should act uh, like a king, you should kind of show your moderation, so, so, so probably it's not that realistic. But my, my question was, I was actually doubting, you said like pol in politics book three, mm -hmm. Aristotle is presenting his ideal vision. Mm -hmm. So I'm not so sure whether it's, we can easily say book three of the politics is simply ideal theory. Uh, you know, there is definition of the citizen, which probably is linked <laughs> to the historical reality. Um, there is this distinction of five types of monarchy, where we could also say these are kind of whatever, with Max Weber we might say these are ideal types to distinguish different forms of monarchy, also historical forms, which helps us to gain knowledge about the, the reality. So, so I'm not so sure. Uh, whether we, uh, whether I would put book three of the politics under the label of ideal theory. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. So just I said, not book three, anti-book three uh, is a kind of, you know, uh, arguments of the first constitution, just these, these, two, uh, these chapters. Oh, okay, uh, limited. that was my misunderstanding. Uh, no, don't worry, but well, and, well, in many, in some, you know, uh, references in uh, empirical books, I still seems to, you know, refer to book <coughs> three rather than book seven. Sorry, I, I don't cite uh, those texts uh, today, but uh, well, uh, well, so you know, uh, just you said there are varieties of monarchy. You know, he somewhere argues about variety of monarchy, uh, refers to arguments, his arguments about variety of monarchies, but that argument clearly, you know, uh, uh, derived from uh, book three, uh, these chapters, uh, and they don't, you know, in book seven or eight. Uh, he doesn't argue about uh, variety of monarchies. So he seems to, you know, have in mind, you know, in empirical books, he ha has in mind book three, uh, these, these chapters uh, about, uh, you know, about uh, aristocracy and the kinship. Of course, in book seven and eight, uh, uh, is not so, uh, uh, these books, uh, in these books, he doesn't talk about, you know, uh, well, details on uh, kinship, etc. Uh, it's a kind of, it's a, and he doesn't use the term kinship. Uh, to, clari to classify, you know, his idea, you know, vision uh, of politics. So, well, just, you know, uh, well, I, su I suppose, you know, in these empirical books, he seems to, you know, uh, refer to these chapters, I suppose. So now two more questions. Uh, Professor Silvia Gastaldi, please. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I I think that uh, it's not uh, a scandal that uh, in uh, uh, that in uh, politics uh, Aristotle uh, described old regime. No, uh, is is not Plato. He is uh, uh, he is describes all the regime uh, bad and good. 
he is uh, realistic. He knows the reality of the uh, Greek situation uh, in uh, his uh, time, and he describes all the possible forms of uh, uh, government. In, uh, the, um, in book five, he discusses the, 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 the topic of the uh, conservation of the Politeia. For him, metabole, or <laughs> worth of all stasis, is a phenomenon uh, who dist uh, which destroyed the city. So, uh, also, tyranny could be uh, conserved. Uh, it's true that uh, the, uh, his image uh, of a tyrant, of a tyrant that uh, uh, have uh, to 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 be uh, to imitate an actor that uh, uh, use uh, this uh, comparison, you know, the uh, tyrant, uh, tyrant and the uh, actor, the uh, the bad tyrant. Uh, would be uh, became uh, as an actor who uh, presents itself uh, in uh, his um, best uh, form to the, to his uh, citizens. And uh, I mm, studied these uh, passages, and uh, I think that uh, he is uh, uh, as an. He, 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 live, he lives in, uh, in, uh, in a time in which tyrants are uh, um, ruling in a different parts of the Greek world. Uh, in uh, Sicily, in, uh, in Thessaly, and so on. So he uh, considers uh, the political phenomena in their uh, materiality, in the reality. And so he uh, says in the tyrant, uh, in the tyrant, uh, a, a ruler that uh, uh, have to uh, maintain his power. And, uh, uh, and, uh, <coughs> and, he, uh, and in uh, this, uh, in this perspective, he, uh, he have to, according to Aristotle, he have to uh, to to rule uh, with moderation and so on. But uh, he, um, but it's uh, not. Uh, it is always in. Uh, 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 is in uh, a, a violent uh, ruler, but he have to moderate this uh, dimension of his character just for maintaining his power. You want to say something? Or? Uh, well, <laughs> so uh, I take uh, you, you uh, offer another piece of evidence for, 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 for my view about the tyranny. Is that right? So sorry, I didn't uh, understand your question, but uh, just you, 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 you talk a little bit about pieces of evidence for you know Aristotle to uh, have many suggestions how how to how to maintain uh, a tyrant as a kind of you know a behaving like a, by behaving like a king. Maybe his position is more realistic than. Ah okay. Ah okay. I see. I see. Ah in that. Okay. Yeah. I see. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So we have one more question. Only a few words in line with uh, Professor Gastaldi said. I see that also not uh, only a sign so as, as uh, instructions for maintaining a tyranny. I think this is the reading of K. This is more a reading uh, influenced by the reception of the text of Aristotle. I see when he's saying, for example, that K, that uh, this is an infamous handbook of tyrants. I see that in the line of the mirrors of princes when Aristotle politics was integrated in this kind of, of political genre that, that is different to what what Aristotle is saying and to the public also he is uh, he's addressing, living perhaps not only in tyrannies or monarchies but in, in, in different political regimes. Yeah? 
So uh, I see also that as a kind of alert, a call of attention addressed to many people to say, well, those are according to the understanding that, that, that Aristotle had in this time about the Mediterranean, the Persians, etc. Et those are the objective signs of, of tyranny that in different, in the, in, the, in the tyrannical regimes that we know, they used to be put in practice. So the, 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 I see that not only as instructions, but that you see more in, in a line of your paper, you see that this is part of the scientific spirit of, of mm -hmm. Aristotle. I don't think it's, this is also your, your perception. You want to say something? Uh, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> you, what's the point? Uh, maybe you can formulate a <laughs> simple question. Yeah. yeah. So if you see that more like a kind of uh, because in your paper I think that was clearer huh. that uh, this is part of, this is not the, uh, not destruction for maintaining a tyranny, mm -hmm. but a kind of traits that Aristotle identifies in tyranny uh, from a scientific point of view. Oh. What would be your 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 point of view about that? Uh, you mean so Aristotle, you know, uh, investigated so many examples of ty tyrants, and uh, uh, so that 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 would be a kind of you know, uh, also a part of scientific uh, his scientific spirit. Just because they they invest he investigated uh, so many examples of tyrant. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean that could be could be yeah, <laughs> could be part of scientific yeah spirit. Uh, well. Yeah, of course. Yeah, maybe I, I should. Uh, yeah, I should. Yeah, say so. But uh, well, just maybe I focus too narrowly on uh, the method. The method. The method for preserving tyranny is just a kind of uh, uh, in line is in line with uh, each task three in in, political, in, in his political, uh, he, in his outline. Uh, yeah, that may be a little bit limited. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I should more say about a more general uh, his general, you know. Frame of investigative tyrants. Okay. Mm. okay, then maybe I, you, I want, I will have a question. You have also a question. Yes, very, very nice. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for your interesting paper. Um, I think that your uh, main perspective was based on uh, the um, techne. Uh, centered on the explanation of this uh, uh, complicated uh, uh, chapter 11 of Politics 5. Um, Professor Gastaldi, on the contrary, introduced the historical perspective in order to read and understand uh, this chapter. I agree with the last intervention of Professor Ejio uh, related to the um, uh, exegetical, exegetical tradition about uh, this uh, book, uh, and but I would like to introduce a third possibility to read this uh, complicated chapter, which is the possibility based nor in uh, techne ars, uh, neither in history, but in uh, the methodos. As, as is to say, the aim, the structural aim of uh, writing about political science. In other words, uh, what do you think on, on the possibility that uh, politics uh, 511 is an example of exploring all the theoretical situations of development of a single political regime? Because maybe, maybe, I underline, maybe this is precisely the task of a treatise on politics this explore, complete exploration. What do you think about it? Okay, so, well, yeah, that, that yeah, uh, could be the case. So uh, it's a kind of, you know, Aristotle also uh, uses that method uh, for uh, describing the history uh, narrative of, uh, you know, uh, developing tyrannies in many countries. So that's also another aspect of his, you know, method in political science. And well, <coughs> So maybe just you know my uh, talk today is a little bit more. Ge it's focused on more general framework of you know his his motivation framework for you know arguing about uh, deviant constitutions and well and so I, I should say more about uh, that uh, well uh, this you know analysis about you know 
changes of constitution and uh, uh, this uh, you know method for preserving tyranny <laughs> is based on his you know analysis of causal uh, explanations causal explanation about uh, wh why you know uh, uh, some you know uh, monarchies uh, were dis di uh, you know uh, destroyed so that kind of you know uh, causes of destruction knowledge about causes of destruction you know help us to uh, understand how to preserve uh, you know tyrannies so maybe you know those are also you know knowledge uh, pieces of knowledge are based on that view of you know uh, art and skill uh, science and so well so your your point uh, maybe you know can be integrated in the entire framework of uh, his you know scientific analysis of political science uh, Okay. Maybe I will ask uh, you uh, a, la a last question. Maybe it's uh, yeah. Maybe. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I am curious about this. Uh, you using this distinction between ideal and non-ideal theories. Um, uh, I, I am not familiar with this approach, but you mentioned uh, in Aristotle politics this uh, ideal uh, approach, and then elements which are which belong to the non-ideal uh, theory. I wonder, uh, adding maybe to the notion of techne. Uh, the notion of physis, because in book one uh, it's a very well-known passage where Aristotle defends that uh, we are political animals. No, so uh, would that would that belong to 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 the to the what you call ideal approach theory in the sense that uh, there is uh, this political dimension in the human nature? So it. Uh, we are just uh, fulfilling this uh, aspect of us, uh, so and then tyrants would be a, a de deviation of mm -hmm. this uh, natural instinct. And I think this is also interesting in terms of uh, the history of the text, uh, no, the discussion between uh, the sumum bonum and the sumum malum that introduced uh, uh, the hermeneutics of, of uh, Hobbes uh, uh, through Leo Strauss and, and, and these authors. So there is this uh, kind of optimism, uh, and I think this is based on nature. Uh, not only on the technical uh, f uh, um, skills of the politicians. So, what what would you say about this physics uh, element? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I I, sh uh, I should yeah talk a little about book one, and uh, yeah maybe you know in some sense you know book one uh, argument about uh, Aristotle human nature as a political animal is a little bit you know. Uh, 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 idealized uh, vision of humans and he uh, somewhere in book one he talks about you know uh, we should consider nature human nature in a you know good you know uh, uh, as a person who has a good disposition uh, uh, we should we should we shouldn't you know we shouldn't draw our attention to a kind of wicked person to understand human nature so may maybe that that statement statement suggests that uh, in some sense you know uh, his uh, you know uh, arguments in book one is a little bit you know, uh, idealized and uh, well of course maybe uh, it's not the description about ideal constitution but uh, well maybe uh, that vision of human nature uh, is a little bit idealized idea uh, part of ideal theory <laughs> okay so thank you very much i think we leave it here and you want to say some words and or we go to okay so thank you very much thank you very much thank you very much